Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the Tech Guy is provided by Cashfly. C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Radio Networks on Saturday, May 10th, 2014. This is episode 1081. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by ShareFile. Enhance your workflow. Send files of almost any size easily and securely with ShareFile from Citrix. Try ShareFile today. For a 30-day free trial, go to ShareFile.com. Click the microphone and enter Tech Guy. And by Prosper. Prosper is a peer-to-peer -peer lending marketplace that connects people who are looking to borrow money with those who have money to lend. Visit prosper.com slash twit and receive a $50 Amazon gift card when you get a loan. And by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your used gadgets. Find out what your used Apple or Android device is worth at gazelle.com. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk about computers and the internet and smartphones and home theater and all that jazz. 88, 88, ask Leo. That's the phone number if you want to call. Ask a question, make a comment, make a suggestion. 888-827-5536. The website is uh, techilabs.com. You'll find the phone number there, links to the chat room, and, of course, audio and video from previous shows, plus all the questions and answers as we talk. We get them on paper, well, <laughs> digital paper, and put them on the website. I don't know. Maybe maybe James DeRuvo just writes them on paper, and I don't know how that works, actually. 888 well, let's see what happened in the world of technology while we were away. Oh, just the end of the Internet, as you know it, but that's okay. We'll survive. I, do, I feel like I'm starting to sound like Chicken Little. First, we were going crazy about the FCC's net neutrality issue. And by the way, that vote comes up Wednesday. The vote is merely to publish the rules, which they haven't done yet. And then to give the public uh, 90 days of comment, something like that. 60 plus 30, I think it is. So uh, I'm not sure why they open the mailbox, except I think they really do want to hear from us. I'm starting to think that this is a more complicated issue than than really we can we can figure out here. Because a number of people have said, well, the last thing you do, want to do is have the... Uh, FCC declared that the broadband providers are common carriers. In fact, AT&T said, if you do that, it's the end of the Internet. <laughs> of course, they don't want to be. They, they know what it's like to be a common carrier. There's a lot more regulation. I don't know if we want a lot more regulation on the Internet. All we, all we want is for Comcast and Verizon and AT&T to just not to, not to screw it up. I think that's a fair thing to ask. We shall see. Then there was this court decision on Friday, and I don't think there's been a lot of coverage on it. But it's a little scary, and it's not over yet because I know Google will appeal to the Supreme Court, but Oracle is suing Google. Now, this is going to—I don't—I probably shouldn't bring this up, but you know me. I want to bring—I want you to be informed and know all this stuff, even though this one's a little bit of a tricky one. Google created, uh, actually purchased, but continues to distribute and improve upon the Android operating system, which many of us have on our smartphones. You're familiar with that. Probably Android. It's the competitor to iOS from Apple and the competitor to uh, Windows Phone, I guess. But, but Google based it on Linux, the Linux kernel, and something called Java, which is a programming language that was written... Oh, almost 20 years ago now by uh, some folks at a company called Sun, Sun Microsystems. 
And Java has some nice advantages. Uh, you know, it's it's a it's a clean language. You write once, and it, you can run it on a variety of platforms, and that's nice. That means Android can run on a variety of different hardware and so forth. Google uh, didn't didn't get a license from Sun. Oh, by the way, Sun was sold to Oracle, which now owns Java. They, but in fact, they didn't even they wrote their own or acquired their own version of Java. The only thing that they copied was the names that you use to call things, you know, how to open a window and so forth. Because programming languages have these, they call them uh, programmer interfaces or APIs, application programmer interfaces. And uh, these APIs are uh, the way that a program that runs on your Android phone can, can talk to the operating system and say, open a window for me or, you know, press this button or whatever. And so you got to have that. And they did copy, admittedly, they copied the names of these that uh, Java used, but nobody thought, well, that's, you can't copyright the names. of. You can copyright the, the code, the programming code. You could even patent some of it, which I'm sure it is. But you can't say, don't use my name. Well, Oracle sued and won. Huh. The Federal Appeals Court, reversing a lower court decision, which was in Google's favor, and, of course, this is bad news for Android, although Google, I'm sure, will appeal and so forth. But it might even be worse news for the rest of the Internet. If you can, if you can prevent other people from using your variable names, your, your names for your functions, you can pretty much stop anything. The Internet relies on the fact that everything all works together like that. It's a very strange court decision. Let's hope the Supremes get this one right. And then also in the news, and I almost don't even want to talk about it, but also in the news is this uh, rumor that Apple might buy Beats. Beats is an interesting uh, story. Dr. Dre, the rap star, I guess has money in it or found it. I don't know who started it. But they make headphones. You've seen them. You've seen all the ads. They make a lot of speakers and headphones. And you know what? That's a good business. That's a very good business because the truth is they're not expensive to make. Nobody knows what's good or bad. So that, you know, if you if you give them a nice strong base, everybody goes, that sounds good. And they've sold and put Dr. Dre's name on it. They sell real well. Then Beats uh, bought a music service called Mog a couple, about a year ago and turned it turned on the Beats Music service a few months ago, which has not been a great success. They, uh, we estimate about 200,000 subscribers, which is nothing compared to Spotify, Google Music, RDO, all the other radio and streaming music services. AT&T has, remember, maybe you've seen the ads have been offering a family plan for Beats Music and stuff. Well, now the rumor Apple's going to buy them for $3.2 billion. I don't even know if I believe that rumor. That's so not, first of all, be the largest by far acquisition Apple's ever made. And why does Apple need a headphone company? Maybe the streaming music, right? I guess. Although I can't imagine that Beats has any deals that Apple can't make. And now the story that Jimmy Yovine, the music producer who runs Beats, and Dr. Dre himself, the rap star, will have executive positions at Apple. Huh? Huh? I'm hoping this is just a crazy rumor. <laughs> you know how Apple rumors are. I think the problem is, you know, Dr. Dre posted on his Facebook page that he is the first rap billionaire, and then he pulled it down. He pulled it off. So it, I have a feeling maybe, I don't know. Table says, Yovine is pronounced Ivine. I-O-V-I-N-E. You know what? There are a lot of people listening in Hollywood. You can tell me how Jimmy pronounces his last name. I cannot imagine. And by the way, HP owns a significant portion of Beats, too. Can't imagine Apple buying Beats for $3.2 billion. Dr. Dre and Jimmy, what's his name, will have significant positions at Apple Computer. <laughs> um... Dre has only 25% of uh, beats, somebody's in the chat room saying. Oh, well, 25% is only $800 million. Aw, oh, shucks. But remember, now, see, but no, but just remember that Dr. Dre is worth about $400 million or $500 million anyway. So he'll put him over the billion mark. He just bought uh, Tom Brady's mansion in Los Angeles, the uh, Patriots quarterback. 
Tom Brady built built a mansion. Never, I don't think he ever lived in it. He sold it, put it on the market almost immediately, for fifty million dollars. And uh, Dr. Dre just bought it for forty million. But you know, it's worth it because it has a moat around it. <laughs> and if you're gonna live in Brentwood, well, you know, it's not a great neighborhood. You gotta have a moat around your house. 8888 Ask Leo. A couple of the big stories uh, we're we're looking at this <laughs> this week. The end of the internet as we know it via the FCC and or Oracle, Google, via the courts, via FCC, via God. Somebody's got their finger in that pie and they're eating it all. And then uh, and then Apple, basically the death rattle of Apple, frankly, if they buy Beats. It's like, what? <laughs> what is, you want to what? You want to make headphones? 8888 Ask Leo. What do you think? Time to talk. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Two things. First of all, Apple has its own deals with music companies. Apple has, there's no company that has better relationship with the music companies. They sell more music than anybody else in the world. And B, if you say, yeah, but Apple would never be able to make these deals because they're Apple. You think the music companies didn't put in the contract to deal with Beats? And if somebody else buys you, you know, we'll, we'll renegotiate? Especially Apple. It's very strange. It's very strange. I do not understand it. Later today, right after the show, a very special pilot episode of a brand new show on the network called I'd Fund That. What? Three. Well, right after the show-ish. Right after the show, we'll start setting up for it. I'd fund that. It's Shark Tank for Kickstarter, kind of. We're going to look at crowdfunded projects. Their uh, founders are going to come and demonstrate the product, make their pitch, and then our panel <laughs> will accept or reject. Jim Cramer says Beats gives Apple the cool factor. What? <laughs> Remember the iPod? Remember the iPhone? I think Apple kind of is already in that market, but all right. What do you think people are connecting Beats to? Nine times out of ten. Well, I have an Ohio State mug because uh, one of our fans for a long time, Darth Emma, is a professor of geology at The Ohio State University, gave me the mug. But I do have other mugs, my friends. La, 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 la. Boom, ba, -dee, ba -dee, do. Dr. Dre in the house. He's mobbing with the... He discovered Snoop Dogg. He discovered Eminem and Eminem. He discovered... Who else? Dre is like the whoop-de-whoop -whoop rap hero. <laughs> I, don't, I just don't get it. I don't understand that. I think, it's a, I think it's a flawed rumor. I think it's not true. We'll see. We'll see. 8888-ASK-LEO. What do you think? Apple buying Beats for, interestingly enough, exactly the same price, according to the rumor, that uh, Google paid for the Nest thermostat. So it's a good deal. And and Beats, I don't know why Beats is so cheap, to be honest. They, they make a billion dollars a year. Shouldn't they be more expensive? I don't know. Or maybe the bottom's falling out of the headphone market. They've struggled with the Beats uh, streaming system, uh, music. I don't know. Heather Haman. Hamana, Hamana, Hamana. What do you, you, you're a music maven. You love the muse. What do you, what do you listen to? Are you eating or something? No. I, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just drinking coffee. I'm Me too. Loving the new latte making, machine. Making copies, drinking coffee. What do I listen through, you mean? Yeah. Like, do you have like a portable music device? Oh, yeah, yeah. What but is I it? I just use the... Your phone. Your phones that came with it, yeah. And you use the Apple earbuds. Mm hmm Like everybody else. They're quite good. They're fine. They came up quite a notch in, great. in the 5S, yeah, I think. They're fine. You know what? Kids today... <laughs> I'm sounding like such an old guy. Kids today don't know good music. They can't tell. They don't know. There's no market for good music. So I don't think, uh, I think, and uh, just, I don't, I don't, I, you know, headphones are very profitable, but they don't buy them for the sound quality. They buy them for the status. For the looks, yeah. That B, that little lowercase B on the side, you know. Just okay. like for a long time, a white headphone was a status symbol because it means you owned an iPod, right? 
Mm -hmm. There's some good looking ones. I mean, sometimes I'm like, oh, maybe that would look good while I'm out there skating with a little. Yeah, the beats look head. good. <laughs> They don't. I mean, they sound okay. They got a lot of extra bass. They're good for listening to Dr. Dre. Oh, okay. They got. Everyone looks all hip like a DJ, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I don't think. I think Apple's not doing it. I just. I'm. I'm going to go on record. I'm going to be the only one in the world saying I think this is a phony rumor. May, yeah, they're maybe down down at the table talking to Dre. But I don't know what they're talking about. It doesn't necessarily mean buying the company. Maybe they're thinking about having lunch. Maybe I don't know. Maybe they want to put a put a Beats headphone in the next iPhone or something. There's all sorts of deals they could be doing. Yeah. Of course, I'm wrong all the time. So don't. <laughs> <laughs> Who should I talk to first here? We got to go to Kenan in Toronto. I don't understand finance, <laughs> business, the markets. I don't understand it. I do understand computers and how they work and cell phones, that kind of stuff. Hi, Kenan. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Leo. Great show. Love your show. Thank you. I also agree with you that Apple rumor, it just doesn't sound Apple-y. It's not Apple-y. <laughs> what is that? Uh, exactly. And, you know, if it's true, then I'm, i got to think Apple's kind of losing its way here. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I had a question, and I appreciate if you could answer it. Somebody recommended to me to use WatchGuard. WatchGuard for your phone? Uh, no, uh, this is for the Wi-Fi, I guess, for the whole home WatchGuard. And uh, I just uh, don't know. I thought that the Wi-Fi in the house should be sufficient enough. But this Wi-Fi, uh, this watch guard, I don't know what that is supposed to do. Is, would you recommend it? Shall no, I, I, you don't need it. it or no, you don't need it. You're, you're at home or is this a business? Home, home. Just yeah. a home. So this is a wonderful category for a company to make a lot of money in because everybody's very aware of and nervous about security these days. Um, I don't think you need a so internet. These are internet security devices. They're boxes you run. Basically, as their firewalls you run in your house, I think it's overkill. Now, I have to say, routers are not very well designed. They're commodity hardware. The companies that make them, like Linksys, don't uh, fix bugs, don't fix security holes. So we know of a lot of problems with routers that exist. But uh, I don't know if these will f this will fix it. You'd be better off getting a, ra a good router uh, with, with that, that doesn't have security problems. So I'm just looking... Um, this person said what that you should do this because you, you just for general kind of uh, because you're very vulnerable with just a regular uh, Wi-Fi. Yeah, it's not really true. A router pro it provides pretty good firewall. We use this kind of thing. We use a Star. Uh, they call them UTM's Unified Threat Management Boxes. They sit between you and the outside world, and they do a little more than just a. a, a a passive firewall, which is what a router is. Um, they're ex how expensive are they? They're like they start at four hundred dollars and then they go up. Well, I mean, it's it's not a. I guess it's I. I have yet to get to the point where we would recommend these. I just think that this is probably not necessary unless you feel that you're a target. <laughs> no. no. Okay, that's fine. Thank you yeah. very much. I think you I, I think my question. Yeah, I think we use, businesses use them, and if you're a business, you probably do need something like this because you are a target just by being a business on the Internet. Um, but I think this is probably more than you need. But what? But it doesn't mean you don't have to pay for or pay attention to, I should say, security. What you need to do is make sure that you have a router that uh, doesn't have any major flaws. We're seeing more and more flaws with routers, uh, unfortunately. Uh, they're they're cheap devices, and uh, they're not worth patching, apparently. Um, on the other hand, they provide basic security because a router sits between you and the outside. You always should have at least a router. It sits between you and the outside world, between your computer, your home network, and the outside world, and it rejects anything it doesn't know about. And if, you've, if you're going to use a Wi-Fi router, here's what I would say. This is what you need to do to make it safe. It's really not very complicated. First of all, do turn off. There are a few things to turn off. The worst is WPS. Now, a lot of routers have this. It's that button you press on the front that gives you automatic configuration. That's a, there's a big security vulnerability with that. 
So turn that off. Now, part of the problem with Linksys is the Lynx, earlier Linksys routers, I don't know if it's still a problem, but for a long time, you'd turn off WPS, but it didn't, turn, didn't do anything. It was just like a checkbox. The WPS was still on, and people could still get into your system. So turn that off. Turn off WAN administration. That's the ability to access your router and administer it, change settings on it from outside your house. Don't, don't let anybody do that. There's no, if you need it, turn it on, but you know if you need it, and if you do, you have a higher standard for security anyway. So turn off WAN, turn off WPS, turn off UPNP. That la allows, without your knowledge, a program or device on inside your house to configure the router without telling you. Microsoft designed it for the Xbox. It's a bad idea. Turn that off. So WPS, U UPNP, and WAN administration. Now you should go in and you should change the router's name. Don't let it be Linksys 04394. Change it to something you know that is not your address or your family name, that is not identifiable information. No point in leaking that out. Change the administrative password and turn on WPA encryption, WPA2 encryption. That's really all you need to do. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Scott Wilkerson. <laughs> hey, Leo. How's it going? So what do, what do your headphone guys say about Beats? <laughs> uh, you know, I should have I should have called Tile about this. Uh, Tile Hertzens at uh, innerfidelity.com. Um, certainly, uh, Beats Beats has been widely credited with uh, the recent resurgence in profits. Higher, no, no, no. <laughs> well, that too. Uh, higher quality audio. You know, they're they're generally considered better than the earbuds that Apple packs in with the with Well, that the wouldn't be and, doing much. No, it wouldn't. Uh, and it's true that that they're very heavily bass oriented. Uh, the $300 Beats are pretty good, though, you think? Yeah, well, I as I buy say, them. you know, I wouldn't either. But in addition to being the fashion statement that they obviously are, they, uh, they have been credited with a resurgence of interest in higher quality audio, uh, mm -hmm. which we now also see with Neil Young and the Pono Project. Right. Um, so, you know, maybe Apple is wanting to get associated with higher quality audio through that particular widely regarded channel. Now, whether or not it's really true that Beats headphones are high quality, I mean, there are plenty of other better headphones, I'm sure. But... Um, I, I don't know either. It's such a widely reported story. My God, I we had to put something up on AVS about it. Well, the way it, it works is one it's one, just everywhere. one person says it. Washington Post says it. No, not Washington Post. Uh, who was it said it? It wasn't even that good a source, mm. the original story. And then everybody picks it up. And it's very hard to know if anybody's adding anything. Like maybe the journal? Right. Uh, if anybody's or just repeating it over and over again, right, right. So how the do you pronounce chamber. Jimmy Yovine? I don't know. Yovine. I have no idea. I Yovine. Uh, Roscoe in the chat room is saying he remembers when uh, uh, Tile was on the on the, my podcast, and and he remembers that he didn't like him at all. That may very well be. Well, they're not. I mean, they're not accurate. Nobody would. No. Nobody would say they're accurate. No. no. But that's they're not. As you say, they're they're designed to listen to Dr. Dre music. Right. <laughs> People familiar with the matter, I think it's BS. <clears throat> I think what it is is that Beats is about to collapse. <laughs> no, seriously, this I think their streaming thing is about to pull them under. You know, that was that's certainly part of the story, and I, that made no sense to me at all. Why would Apple buy a streaming music service when they've already got, you know, iTunes and, well, that's a download service, but still. They don't need it. They don't need it. And why would they pay a $3.2 billion? I, so I read something online that said, well, they've, they've got to spend some cash. They've got, they're so cash. No, in fact, the, the real problem is this is not, this is an American company. They don't want to spend the cash in America. They have to pay tax. Mm. Okay. We're rocking in the free world. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Mr. Neil Young, one of the proponents of uh, higher quality 
digital music, along with Dr. Dre. <laughs> it's hard to say that with a straight face. Yeah, it's hard. Iveen. I'm told now it's pronounced Iveen, which doesn't make any... It's spelled I-O-V-I-N-E. Jimmy Iveen. Anyway, I, sh ought to, I ought to know, on it, but I don't know. Never, never did know. Hey, that's Scott Wilkinson, home theater geek. He is the uh, host of the Home Theater Geek podcast, twit.tv slash HTG, and editor-in-chief at the AVS Forum. What do you think of Beats headphones? You love them? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're not accurate, well, but they never pretended to be accurate, right? No, they never did. Everyone acknowledges that they're very bass-heavy, as you they're said earlier. They're for listening to rap know. music. It's for listening to rap music, exactly. <laughs> However, I, I will say... Or tuba that music. That too. It would that sound too. really good. You know, maybe As I should a tuba get a player. Just, just to listen to my tuba. That's I true. I think you need some beats. <laughs> they make less expensive ones. They make three hundred dollar beats, which at least are a little bit more accurate. Yeah. And then of course they make little weird, you know, those that bullet speaker that uh, you see a lot of ads for and stuff. Yeah, it's true. Now I, I have to say that Beats is often given credit for raising the awareness of, of of wanting higher quality audio playback you know the the little earbuds that apple ships with its products are generally considered yeah not so great at least by people who who really want better music fidelity and so beats brought to a wider audience not just this little audiophile community uh that hey we can get better quality sound out of our ipods or phones or whatever uh and that was helped along probably partly because in the first five years of Beats, they were manufactured exclusively by Monster. Right. So Another company that <laughs> oversells <laughs> well, and underdelivers, shall we say. Well, shall we say. But they, they are also ostensibly concerned with audio quality. Um, I think so, both these companies are concerned with margins, with profit well, margins. Well, certainly, of and, course. And they, they realized, as a, and, and, and I don't think they opened the floodgate for high-quality audio. They made of headphones a status symbol. And, uh, and if you go to a CES this year or anywhere mm -hmm. where they're showing new stuff, there are way, they're way overrepresented headphones. And the reason is they're cheap to make. And people yes. will spend hundreds of dollars for $15 worth of parts. Yes, and everybody wants to jump on that bandwagon. And it's about marketing, and I think Jimmy Iovine and Dr. Dre are marvelous marketers. I think this whole thing is a marketing ploy, trying to look at how much everybody's talking about Beats. Yeah, no kidding, no kidding. So I don't well, buy it's it. Not, I wish. Yeah, I, I, I mean, if there were nothing there, Apple probably by now would have probably denied it. But they have a relationship. They sell Beats in the Apple Store, and maybe they're trying to make a deal of some kind. You know, I'm not saying they're not talking to Beats, but I can't imagine Apple spending $3.2 billion to buy something yeah. that isn't really worth that much. Yeah. I mean, th this whole thing about uh, Beats promoting or bringing high-quality audio into the wider audience uh, was borne out. I, I moderated a panel at CES last January about the resurgence of high-quality audio. And, you know, my panelists were people from Sony and Pioneer and Andrew Jones from Pioneer, who's very respectable in, in high quality audio and uh, they both cited beats as yeah. bringing yeah, they're good bringing this awareness and then we get uh, neil young we, we heard neil right. young uh in the bumper music coming in and you know he's got this pono project where he wants to deliver uh, digital music with higher than cd specifications uh and there's a debate raging on avs forum right now about whether or not that really makes a difference that you can hear Right, you know, so there's, that's there's that's a big that's a big question too. It's a huge yeah. question, and I think kids uh, and uh, people our age can't hear much anyway. <laughs> the kids because yeah, they because right. they yeah. listen too loud, and we because we we listen too loud when we were kids. Right, and we've exactly. lost the high end. Right. Well, and and as people age, you lose the high end anyway. Even if you didn't listen too loud as a kid. You know what's true? We love music. Everybody loves music. That's right. That's Music's right. great. Music's great. Yeah. But is CD quality? Uh, good enough can can will the Pono project which they talk about they're talking about not 16 bits of digital resolution but 24 bits which yeah. in, increases the dynamic well, range and as you know I bought one 
I haven't got it. Oh, that's yet. true. Get, you haven't gotten it, it yet. Fall. Well, no, I think it's October. It's, uh, oh, I see. Okay, okay. Yeah. Well, man, I can't wait to hear what you think about it. You know what they did uh, that really may make more of a difference? As and we've talked about this before. They use high quality parts, particularly yes. their digital to analog converter. Yes. That's the thing, the chip in your computer, your sound card, or sometimes in external boxes that take the bits that are on the hard drive and turn them into audio that the headphones or the speakers can reproduce. Right, they have analog. to have analog. Yeah. And the quality of that seems to make the more difference in almost anything. That's right, that's right. Plus the quality of the original recording. Well, uh, my friend one. Mark Waldrop, who uh, runs AIX Records, uh, talks about the provenance of a recording. How was it recorded? How was it edited? How did it get delivered to you? Did it get down res, down res, right. down sampled during the process? Well, that's one of the little scandals of one of the uh, HD music uh, sites. You can buy yes. high def music now. HDtracks.com. Uh, yeah, the, apparently they were up selling up sampled tracks. That's right. That's right. Which and not only wouldn't sound better, they'd probably sound worse. Yes, yes. And some people found out by actually running a, a spectral analysis uh, on some of the files that they downloaded well now, as from a that site. As a consumer, I don't know what to do. Yeah, it's very tough. It's very tough. And I think part uh, of that is because you can't really tell. It's like wine. You can't tell. <laughs> Speaking of well, provenances, it's, you well, can't tell the difference. Well, you can if you're experienced. If you uh -huh. spend the time and educate yourself and listen to stuff, there's a great, uh, Philips in, in the Netherlands has a great site that uh, trains you, that, that if really? you go through its training process, you can increase and improve your acuity, your listening acuity, to be able to hear smaller differences. And that may be a bad thing. <laughs> well, it may be. It, it, this brings up the question of, as a musician, I go to a concert and I'm always listening, oh, that guy's out of tune, oh, the second bassoon is, came in late, uh, which an uneducated listener wouldn't even notice. Phillips called so, it the Golden Ears Training Program. Exactly. Exactly so. Pop, pop, pop. GoldenEars.Phillips.com. Is it free? It's very cool, actually. It's free. Yeah. I'm going to have to do this. Although, again, this might be a mistake. <laughs> now, now you'll hear stuff that's, and you'll go, oh, that sounds terrible. When you thought yeah. before, you thought it sounded good. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. A little knowledge is a dangerous thing. It is. Or, in other words, a blessing and a curse. Yeah. You know? uh, yeah. It's a tough one, all right. What do you uh, what do you like for headphones? Well, for headphones, See, I think I, I'm glad headphones are coming back because when you and I were kids yeah. 100 years mm -hmm. ago, <laughs> we would lie on our backs with the album. There's another thing yeah. gone. The yeah. liner notes, you know, because you had a yeah. lot of space on an album, you could yep. there were t tons of stuff on there wearing our cost Pro 440As or whatever they that's, those were. That's pro. precisely what I had. Yeah. <laughs> they weighed 42 pounds. That's right. You couldn't get up off the ground because your head yeah. was way down with these headphones. And then you'd yep. listen, you know, to Space Jams from the Pink Floyd or whatever. And right. And that yep. was that was that's, music. That's exactly right. That's and exactly I right. I think headphones are great. I I. So do you have a? I you, love them. Do you have a favorite? Grado I, or Sennheiser or? Well, I, uh, these days I'm listening to the. Um, a B and W P5, which is a portable, kind of a portable headphone, an on-ear headphone that I like very much. Also, uh, PSB makes the uh, M4U. How much are we uh, talking is, here? Well, those are a few hundred bucks. Okay, I think uh, that's so, one thing that that you can credit Beats with. People getting used to the idea that you know to get good headphones, you might be spending uh, north of two hundred dollars. Exactly, exactly. Oppo, believe it or not, Oppo, the, the Blu-ray player company, yeah. just came out with a pair of headphones. I think they're four or 500 bucks. Everybody's raving about them. I haven't tried them yet. I can't wait to Where try them. Where is a site that you can go and learn about headphones? Oh, innerfidelity.com and head.fi, F-I dot org. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Scott Wilkinson, the home theater guy. Thank you. You bet. Head.fi, head? Head-fi. And these are these are independent forums for uh, audio files, that kind of thing. Well, HeadFi is is an independent forum. Do they certainly, no. It's mostly a forum. No, okay. it's a forum. And then inner uh, and innerfidelity.com is uh, more of a. I mean, it's a it's a community site. They've got commenting and stuff, but it's more to do. It has Tile Hertzens is the head there, and and he's very good. He's got a really nice measurement rig. He when he reviews headphones, they're all measured and carefully um, 
analyze. So there, he, he's very good. HeadFi.org is more of a community site uh, with a lot of people contributing their own uh, reviews, not professional reviews, but user reviews. Uh, and uh, Jude Mansilla is the guy there, and uh, he's also very, very good. So uh, I can't wait to try these Oppo headphones. They sell a headphone amp, and that's the other thing is a lot of people say you got to have a good headphone amp. Got to have a good amp. You exactly can't be right. Thousand ninety nine. Whoa! Oh, oh, is it that much? Oh, I, I'm Holy sorry. Holy camoli! I and misspoke. That I doesn't include the amp. Much. Oh man! But All it right. does well, include planar magnetic people. technology. Oh, it's there. It's a phenomenal headphone. Everybody says special stand, only seventy nine dollars. <laughs> but wait a minute, maybe it includes the amp. Where, where's does it say amp? Oh, Do I man, need an amp? I've, I've got the, my nice, you know, Onkyo and Denon uh, AV receivers. Do I really need an amp? It's a good question because they're planar magnetic. You might need an amp. Coming off the computer, you for sure would would want. Yeah, one. yeah, but but maybe off of your uh, AVR. I'm not sure. I miss thirty two ohms. Thirty two ohms. That's yeah. high, isn't it? Uh, for speakers, it's really high. Um, for I headphones, I've known headphones to be up to 600 ohms. Really? Oh. Yeah. What are these? Let me look at mine. 55 ohms. So I guess you're right. I guess that's actually pretty low impedance. Yeah. So maybe you don't need a special amp. It says 102 yeah, maybe dB not. sensitivity and 1 milliwatt. So this these are pretty efficient, actually. But yeah. Yeah. as long as we're looking at headphones, let's look at the ha- Oh yeah, it's only eleven ninety nine. <laughs> what for the amplifier? Yeah, but wait. Okay. Was I looking at the PM twos? Oh, those are coming soon. Those are the next generation Oppos. Those are only six ninety nine. So they're okay, going to do a those, less those expensive. Those must be the one I'm thinking of. Those yeah. are coming soon. So between the PM one and what is planar magnetic? What does that mean? Well, it's a uh, it's the it's the technology of the diaphragm, the thing that vibrates and creates the sound waves. Uh, a planar magnetic diaphragm is a flat surface, a flat diaphragm, a flat piece of plastic, basically, that um, has it's it's conductive, and so it conducts the uh, uh, the audio signal through it, and it sits between uh, a mag two magnets, and as the audio signal it, which is an AC signal, right? It's uh, right. alternating current. As it goes back and forth, it pushes that m the diaphragm towards and away from each of these magnets, and that's what causes the sound. It's very efficient. It can. It requires very little current, which is probably why they have the the higher impedance than a speaker. Certainly, uh, it doesn't need to travel very far, and, and it's very high quality, very flat response. Uh, it's a very well respected technology, usually found in. Uh, either speakers in a much larger piece right. of plastic, right. or in, the, in some some headphones already use this technology, but they're generally in the many thousands of dollars. Uh, so this is a deal. So this is a steal. <laughs> hmm. <clears throat> huh? Do you want to? We, we're out of time for this break. I used up. Your I'm happy time. to stick around till noon. Stick sure. around. Thank you, sir. You're a good man, you Charlie Brown. My pleasure. Thank you, Scotty. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. It's kind of hard to escape the feeling that. If you spent $1,000 on a headphones or you spent, you know, $10,000 on a stereo, you would just, you would imagine it sounded better. <laughs> you would have to, right? You would have to say, look, I spent so much money. It must sound better. And then you would believe it. What happens if you spend $3.2 billion on a headphone company? You have to think it's better. Oh, sound good. 8888-ASK-LEO. Let's go to Phoenix, Arizona and spin. Hi, spin. Uh, hi, Leo. So I would like to thank you first. You helped me actually buy my last DSLR, and I've been using it oh, for well over five plus. By the way, I, I, I got your name wrong. It's, is it Shrin? Yeah, it's Shrin. Oh, sorry about that, Shrin. So what, what did you buy? Well, I bought a Canon DSLR, like a 40D, about probably oh, in nice. 2008. Sweet. And I used it. Go ahead. And I and I used it for uh, quite a while now, and I've actually used it for so long now. Now I've uh, actually put it up for sale. I'm lo looking to switch to a mirrorless setup. Yeah. So I'm kind of tired of carrying all the lenses yeah. and the body and the tripod and all this stuff. Yeah, I think mirrorless is the way to go. Now, uh, there are two...
kind of camps on this. One is the Micro Four Thirds, which is a small sensor, relatively. Um, but the Micro Four Thirds system is supported by a number of manufacturers. There's a broad, broad range of lenses and body choices. I, I happen to like the Olympus OMD, and they make two. They're around a thousand bucks. These are less expensive. They're lots lighter. On my last uh, trip, I took an OMD and I loved it. The EM5 is the one I took, and now they have an EM1, which is uh, the high-end version, and it has Wi-Fi built in. It's a beautiful camera. So I, would, I wouldn't hesitate to recommend that. The other direction is to go with Sony, and I think their NEX cameras are superb, and they even make a full frame. So the NEX cameras, I think, are APS-C sensors, so they're bigger than the Micro Four Thirds. Uh, but then you're all Sony, you know. And then they make uh, the A7s, which are full frame sensors. And to my knowledge, these are the, I, I think, the only or the, the only reasonably priced full frame sensors with no mirror. No mirror means much simpler operation, no big chunk. Uh, the camera body can be a whole lot smaller because it doesn't have to contain that mirror and all the mechanism to move it around. The mirror is what you look through in a single lens reflex, an SLR. You look through the viewfinder and the mirror, it's actually a kind of a prism device one-way mirror mirror lets you look through the lens so when you're looking through the viewfinder you're seeing exactly what the lens sees that's wonderful now if you take away the mirror yes you reduce size and complexity and cost but you have to figure out some way to see what the lens sees and they do that with a video camera a little video tap and I don't think the quality is as good so you should try these to make sure you can live with it. It's no longer an optical viewfinder. It's a video viewfinder. And so the resolution is a little lower. It does mean they could put more into the viewfinder. You know, they, there's a lot more information in the viewfinder. It's kind of like the back of your camera. But uh, I, I have to say the, uh, the alphas, the A7 and the A7, I have an A7R, are beautiful, beautiful cameras, give you great results. There are just very few lenses for them. Uh, and if you buy a lens adapter, be prepared for very slow focusing. You, you almost have to use manual focusing. So there's have a. You heard anything about the, have you heard anything about the Fuji mirrorless cameras? I th now, Fuji makes some Micro Four Thirds, I believe. So, uh, are these Micro Four Thirds or another format? They're their own for. They're their own okay. uh, thing. So I've thing. liked they're the Fuji cameras a lot. I think they they make very good cameras too. The problem again is. The only standard in this is Micro Four Thirds, but people, a lot of people don't think that the sensor is too small. And, you know, as I've mentioned before, a big sensor on a camera, on a digital camera, lets in more light, gives you more pixels, gives you more accuracy. It really makes a difference in the quality of the image. Um, you're, I don't know what size your 50D is. I would guess it's APS-C. We have these, they're so confusing. We have all these different, you know, <laughs> think they just give you an inches. How big is it? Or millimeters or something? No, we got the... APS-C, we've got full frame, which is effectively a 35 millimeter. Uh, we've got micro four thirds. Uh, so Fuji is APS-C, but it's an X mount. Okay, so it is, that's a, APS-C is something you're kind of used to, and I think probably the minimum you'd be happy with. Going backwards to micro four thirds might be disappointing. <sighs> does Canon also have a mirrorless? I think it does, does it not? I think they've added a mirrorless to the bunch they you know they but everybody will at some point because this is becoming a hot category i think that both canon and nikon are going to be slow to the party because um they uh they've got such an investment in dslrs yeah canon canon does make a eos m i don't, I don't know much about it i tell you what i bought the sony the sony nex uh, bought it for my son. He loves it. It's a great camera with lots of lens choices. If you want to go full frame, uh, the A7 is a very, very good choice. Uh, but mirrorless is nice. I really like mirrorless. You don't. It's so much lighter. I went recently went back to my 5D just to, for some special stuff I wanted to shoot it. It's so heavy. It's like you feel like you're carrying a child around. Um. <laughs> so. So I'm not sure I have a perfect recommendation for you. If you want to stick with your Canon lenses, you probably I don't know if you've bought a lot, then you would want to look at the EOS M or the M2. Anthony in Laguna Niguel, California. Hi, Anthony. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, good day, Leo. Happy Saturday. Good day to you too, sir. Thank you. All right. Uh, I have a Galaxy S3, and I cannot send picture photographs to Australia. T-Mobile can't fix it. I've been on uh, it. It's an MMS issue, yeah. 
Yeah, I've ha I've had that issue uh, sending um, MMS. That is MMS is is me, you know media files, pictures, audio, video, instead of just plain right. text, uh, overseas as well. And I think that that's just a restriction of the carriers in Australia. And in my case, it was Mexico. No kidding. Can you just email it? Uh, I I have I don't know how to do that. You know. A couple of things. First of all, you, you need on your smartphone an email program, obviously. And you can, in most cases in the gallery, when you have choices of ways to share it, one of the ways will be email. But uh, here's a handy little tip. Most carriers, I don't know if this will work in Australia, but most carriers, certainly in the U.S., will accept email. There's a, you'll have to, have to go online and if it's Telstra or somebody, look what their system accepts. But for instance, for AT&T, uh, I think it's uh, the phone number at txt.att.net something like that and right. and and that's an email address that will appear as a as a, a text message on the phone so okay. there may be ways to get around this but worst case uh I, you know you can always email it uh, the chat room's well, giving me a link t-mobile's got a link to mms that's the technology you need uh abroad and i you know i think they're 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 saying the same thing which is that it's essentially uh incompatibility Right. So, well, my business, my business partner in Australia can send me photos all the time. Yeah, uh, he he goes through Telstra, but I I can't send photos to him. It won't accept. So if you have, let's see, to send and receive, this is T-Mobile's website. Send and receive MMS messages to and from international phone numbers. Uh, he's it says here that AT and T will work with Optus and Telstra in Australia. Okay. So, uh, and you, and what did T-Mobile tell you when you talked to them? Is it Optus or Telstra? You said it was Telstra? It, yeah, it's Telstra, and I'm yeah. with T-Mobile, and they, their tech department. I went up the ladder with them, and I spoke to their top people, and they said, well, maybe we don't have a contract with them. <laughs> yeah, maybe they had one, and they lost it. On their website, it says you can, but, uh, you know, if you can't, then you can't. And it's and my I guess my, my message is it's not unusual. Um, but there are alternatives. Email it. 8888-ASK-LEO. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. More calls after this. That's, by the way, one reason people use WhatsApp. And that would be another uh, alternative, uh, is to get your buddy to use WhatsApp or a similar uh, messaging application. The reason WhatsApp took off around the world is because people... Uh... Oh, let me put Scott back on. Sorry, Scott. Hey, no problem. I'm using up your time. Oh, well, it's it's by your good grace that I have the time at all, and I Take thank you so away. much. Take it away. i got to figure out why it's so hot in my office here. Ooh, it's all yours. Yeah, I gotta... Okay, thanks. Tech Dino in the chat room said, the, the Lego Simpsons episode rocked, and I agree. It was fantastic. Um, really, I, I just, you know, after, what, 20-some years, The Simpsons remains very creative and innovative and fresh. I love it. I just love it. I have never gotten tired of it at all. So uh, here I am, chat room. Hey, how's it everybody going? Uh, Brian N.W. says, Simpsons jumped the shark 15 years ago. Eh, you know, that's uh, everyone to each their own, I say. I still love it. Um, so, uh, hey, ISIS agent. Himtez, he's okay. Glad to hear that. So, um, oh, yeah, good. Rusty Bones, exactly right. The new NAD headphones. I, I'm sorry I didn't mention those. Uh, they are highly, highly regarded, really highly regarded uh, for 300 bucks. Uh, again, that's 300 bucks, but uh, also designed by Paul Barton, who did the PSB M4Us, and uh, they're, they're fantastic. I totally agree. I don't have one a set yet. I hope to get some, but I have heard them, and man, oh, man, they're really great. Uh, best headphone for under $100? I'm not a headphone expert to that degree. I say go over to headfi.org. That's head-fi.org or innerfidelity.com. No dash in that one. And uh, uh, you should be easily be able to find really great uh, headphones for under $100. Uh, both uh, Jude Mansilla and uh, Tile Hertzens uh, will have great recommendations for you there. Apple fan, how you doing? Red Penguin, glad to see you. Um, w. Scott is one. Why was Gravity such a success? I saw it and didn't think it was all that special. 
Once again, to each their own, I saw it and I thought it was really special. And I, I've heard plenty of people say that it wasn't, okay? So, you know, sometimes I'm in the minority, often, in fact. Uh, I saw Transcendence and I loved it. I thought it was fantastic. Uh, but uh, it got less than 20% on Rotten Tomatoes and it came and went really fast. So, <sighs> no accounting for taste, I'm afraid. I thought it was a very intelligent movie. Uh, why was Gravity such a success? Well, uh, certainly if you saw it in Dolby Atmos, that was really impressive. Uh, Dolby Atmos is this movie sound system uh, that you can't get at home with speakers all around and on the ceiling and what's called object-based audio, which means that the mixer, the guy who's putting the sound together, guy or gal, uh, is panning things around the room without regard to what channel should it go in. He just got a joystick and he's moving these sounds around. And uh, that was very, very effective in Gravity. The 3D was very effective in Gravity. Now, Gravity was mostly CGI. I, uh, there wasn't that much live action. Uh, so it was very easy to do 3D. Um, and, and it was very, very effective. Uh, the music was great, I thought. Um, just, just everything about it, I thought, was, was wonderful. Not perfect, of course. Neil deGrasse Tyson, the host of Cosmos, uh, wrote a piece about it saying, well, they got a few things wrong, like Sandra Bullock's hair didn't respond as it would in true weightlessness, and that's true. Uh, you know, there were a lot of things that strained credulity, shall we say, um, as there were in Transcendence. But Transcendence in particular, gravity was supposed to be about present day, more or less. Uh, Transcendence was about the future, short-term future, uh, but I just thought it handled the issues of uh, consciousness and artificial intelligence and nanotechnology and quantum computing, uh, all these things that, that I find so cool to think about. Uh, I thought they were handled very, very well. So uh, Janiscu7 asks, have I heard the creative Arvana headphones? No, I haven't. Platinum headphones? I haven't. So um, we shall see. Uh, Grados SR60s, Rusty Bones says, uh, well regarded. Uh, they, they do sound great. They've been around forever. Uh, under a hundred bucks, probably. I believe that's probably true. So that's certainly one good recommendation. Thanks, Rusty Bones. Appreciate that. Um, Murray on Travel Netflix has started sending me two discs at a time. I only have a single subscription. What's up with that? Uh, couldn't tell you. I don't know. I don't, I don't have a Netflix disc by mail subscription. I only have the uh, streaming subscription. Um, so Apple fan says, yes, I uh, asked me if I have, if I use iPhone. Yes, I, I use an iPhone. That's what I use. I'm an, I'm an Apple guy. Um, I wouldn't exactly say a fanboy, uh, but I have had Apple computers ever since the Mac 512. You know, um, and, uh, Sprint just released a version of the HTC One M8 that has um, Harman Kardon sound, and it plays high bit rate up to 192.24 ah. files. Wow. What what was this again? It's the HTC One, which used to be oh, oh, Beats. Oh. Now it's Boom Sound because they, they Boom Sound HTC sold off its stake in Beats. Yeah. Um, most most of my friends uh, and colleagues in the industry think that uh, 192 kilohertz sampling rate is overkill. Yeah, you don't need yeah. it. It's you really don't need probably it. the bit rate that's more important. Well, sampling. yeah, the dynamic range yeah. is probably more important. Right. On the other hand, how much dynamic range can we hear? How much dynamic range is there in music right. to begin with? Electronic music can benefit really strongly from wider dynamic range and higher sampling rates uh, for, for greater frequency response. Because synthesizers, of course, can can push the limits of, of sonics all over the place. But an orchestra, you'll have a hard time getting an orchestra to go to go to 100 dB dynamic range on anything but Bolero or Pines of Rome or something that, like Bolero, you know, starts off with a super, super, super quiet snare drum and then ends up with the entire orchestra blasting your hair off. And, and that certainly exceeds the 96 dB of CD dynamic range. Um, Jabba7814 says, you hit the word intelligence, think of today's audience. Yeah, well, I thought Transcendence was quite intelligent and it got very little play and sometimes I think the mass yeah, market isn't gone. interested. It's already, it's already gone. gone. I know. Such I a know. disappointment. I didn't get to see it. 
I'm really sorry. When it comes yeah. out on Blu-ray or streaming, oh, yeah, I'll or whatever, get it right away. I've been really trying not it. to see as many movie th movies in the theater because I because, but her is not even still available for rent. It really frustrates me. They've really slowed yeah. down the. Uh, well, that's that's now out on Blu-ray. Yeah, they've they've got the window now, so that you they're trying to get you to buy the disc, and it's gonna right. be three more days, three or three, five. I think May thirteenth, it'll be available for rent. It's yeah. very frustrating what they the movie industry sucks so bad. <laughs> Jeez. All right. Now, time Here we to go. go. Thank you, Scotty. You bet. My See pleasure. Ya. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, cell phones, camcorders, home theater, all that jazz. 88, 88 Ask Leo's the number. I love to talk digital photography, uh, too. I've been taking a look at this uh, Fuji XT. One, which is the uh, the uh, camera that uh, our caller was asking about, the mirrorless camera. It looks pretty sweet. Looks pretty nice. It's an APS-C size sensor. That's a, For a lot of people, that's a big enough sensor. That's a nice size sensor. It's a little pricey. With The body alone is 1300 bucks. It's bigger than Micro Four Thirds, but it is mirrorless, so it's, it's compact. I don't have a lot of experience with uh, with uh, Fujifilm interchangeable lens cameras, um, but I will. I'm, you know, you know me. I'll, any excuse, I'll buy a camera. I love playing with those. <laughs> Eighty-eight. I'm not a good photographer, so I make it up by buying more cameras. Eighty-eight, eighty-eight. Ask Leo. That's the phone number. Diego's in Corona, California. Our next call. Hi, Diego. Leo Laporte here. Hi, Leo. I'm a big fan. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. What can I do for you? Okay, so I bought a MacBook Pro in January 2013. Yes, sir. And so, you know, I needed an update because I had an old Dell. So, anyways. Nice choice, I think. Are you having trouble with it? Well, the thing is, is you know, I, I do a lot of gaming, and I play a lot of League of Legends. And the problem is it makes a really weird rattling noise and like in the, through the center of the the keyboard you have a I, I think you have a bad fan do you think it's the fan yeah does it come and go does it go up and down or is it always there no well i i feel like it only comes up when the like, laptop kind of overheats yeah it's a fan sure. yeah it's a fan it's either a bad bearing or it could be that the fan blades are a little uh, off center but uh, how, it's how old? A year old? Yeah, it's about a year old. Get it in there before the year runs out because it's under warranty unless you bought Apple Care. Well, honestly, I, I use the Best Buy Geek Squad protection plan. Oh, well, bring it in because that's what's wrong. It's the fan. Well, yeah, well, sadly it expired, but that's why Yeah, <laughs> of course. So <laughs> Yeah. Laptops, I'll tell you the thing about laptops is they're unlike desktops, they they get carried around, they get shaken around. They, you know, they take a little bit more of a beating than than you know, a desktop computer system. And the fans in there, sure, that's that's something that could easily get kind of knocked loose or something. Probably not an expensive repair. Uh it, it merely it means taking the old one out and putting a new a new one in. And fans are cheap. So I would guess that that's not going to be the most expensive thing to do. But you're going to, you know, if you, I would get it fixed. For one thing, you don't know if that fan's hitting something. That rattling sound could be bad bearings, but it could also be the blade hitting a wire. And if you don't, if it's that's the case, you don't want to lose the rest of the computer. So I wouldn't waste much time trying to fix it. I mean, uh, not fix it. I would get it fixed as, as quickly as possible, Diego. That sounds like a bigger problem. Waiting to happen. Bob in, ba in Barkersville or Bakersville, uh, North Carolina. Hi, Bob. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, Leo. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Good, good. I'm kind of a novice, but I've been listening to your show the past year or so, and I'm slowly learning. But All right. Of, uh, By uh, osmosis, that's the plan. We just sink <laughs> right through that brain of yours. Well, I listen to you on KPHX, and here it comes on. Uh, it's like 9 to 12 at night. Excellent. Uh, well, time. tell you what, ask your question now, and then tonight you can get the answer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this problem, when I was listening to you last week, you uh, mentioned the problem with uh, the Internet Explorer browser. It's a current oh, problem. It's a nightmare browser, yeah. So anyway, so I switched over to Google Chrome in terms Good man. of browsing. Yeah. And I, I also... On my own, as you suggested, I got rid of Adobe Flash Player, Adobe Reader. 
And, uh, and then on my and own. The only, by the way, the only reason I say that is because these seem to be, you know, th those are two applications that get anything that gets run when you're on the Internet. And those are two applications right. that do. If you if you go to a page that has Flash or PDF content, that's what's going to run. Those things are targets for bad guys. And Adobe seems to have a lot of uh, you know security issues with both Reader and Flash. Uh, the nice thing about Chrome is it has its own, it has Adobe Flash, but it's built in. It's kept up to date. Uh, I think it's safer to use it sandboxed inside the tab that you're on. So I just feel like it's safer to use Flash that way. If, and you still have to use it. A lot of sites require it. Uh, Reader, there are other choices that are probably not much more secure, but they're just less attacked by the bad guys because most everybody uses Adobe Reader, so the bad guys figure, hey, this is a good bet. Okay. But the problem I've had since then, it may have had something to do with something I clicked on that I shouldn't have. I don't know. But uh, this only happens on the Internet Explorer browser when I'm on the uh, homepage for MSN or AOL. Yeah. They have these pictorial news items, you know, that yeah. have like one to three pictures. You yeah. click the arrow, the next two to you. Well, anyway, on the Internet Explorer browser, I can't click on those arrows. They're either not there or when I click on them, it doesn't move the frame. Huh. Whereas on Google Chrome, it's working still. Uh, well, it's if it, if those are frames, and I'm not sure, but if those frames are flash, and you got rid of flash, that would explain it. Well, no, I went ahead and put the flash back in. Oh, all right, didn't it, fix so. it. Okay, that was a good test. Uh, I'm not sure, frankly, uh, what's going on there. Uh, it doesn't sound like it's necessarily uh, malware, like, which is obviously what you're worried about. Um, right. But uh, I, it's hard to say. So. There are things, for instance, if you download software from download.com or other sites like that, sometimes there's they're wrapped in downloaders that will install toolbars into your browser, like the Ask toolbar, things like that. It might be that there's a toolbar in Internet Explorer or something, Some bra they call them browser helper objects that uh, are launching whenever you launch Internet Explorer. So what, what what I'd like to do is is have you run Internet Explorer kind of in, in something we call, you know, like safe mode, basically. That is, without any extensions, and see if you still have the same problem. Um, what version of IE are you using? Yeah, I just updated about a, in the past month to IE 11. Okay. This, you know, they changed how safe mode works, unfortunately. Well, uh, yeah, that might have been where I caught the problem. I'm not sure, but uh, when I... Uh, you know, I looked it up under Google Chrome, IE 11, and uh, I thought I was on the IE site, but it turned out I was on CNET site, and so I actually downloaded the IE 11. Yeah, CNET site will do it. Do ne and, So uh, never, uh, ever, uh, ever <laughs> get uh, anything from anybody but the original creator. In this case, Internet Explorer, absolutely get it from Microsoft. If it's on CNET site, I have all sorts of suspicions. Yeah, well, I did it accidentally, and then I asked Yeah, the, it's uh, easy, and that's why they do it. It's easy. You do a search for Internet Explorer. First thing that comes right. up is download.com. It should be Microsoft.com. So right. I agree. Yeah. That's kind of an issue. Um, what you can do is uh, your Windows 7, Windows 8? Uh, 7, HP. 7. seven. So um, you just search for uh, Internet Explorer, and you'll see a version that says no add-ons. That's probably the easiest way to do this. Launch so it. After, yeah, after I did the CNET thing, I went ahead and uh, got rid of it, and then I went to the Microsoft site. And yeah, but, you know, the, the thing that there. came along with the download is still there, right? Not Right, right. <laughs> so I suspect that's what's going on. Now, the good news is, because CNET doesn't want to get accused of uh, putting malware on your system, the, the only thing to distinguish these browser helper objects and toolbars from malware is that they have an uninstall capability. So you can go to your programs and features control panel, look for anything odd. You'll know what's, you know, you, you'll know what you installed. Anything that you didn't install, look for, and it'll say things like, you know, search tool and things like that. So you want to uninstall those. That might be the easiest way to get rid of this. They're not really malware uh, because they will uninstall. But they're certainly not friendly, and I would get rid of them. Try running Internet Explorer without add-ons. See if things work better. Um, that conduit, search for that one. That's a biggie. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Huh, yeah, find the day conduit got installed. Sort by date. 
<laughs> and uninstall everything that was installed on that day. Good tip. Good tip. <laughs> That's a great tip. See, unfortunately, uninstalling whatever it was you downloaded from download.com does not uninstall all the other crap they gave you. I'm really, uh, you know, we have, we spent a lot of energy. Somebody called and uh, or emailed me and said, hey, every time I uh, use, every time I go to Tech Guy Labs and I go to the episodes, it tries to download malware. Your site has malware on it. I said, I don't think so. I would have heard it, right? Somebody else would have said so. So I spent a lot of energy looking. I said, send me screenshots, blah, blah, blah. And um, had uh, had Russell and uh, and uh, our engineers look at it, and they didn't see bear. And they, no, there's no malware here. And this is the problem. There's so many, so many people. Uh, and Windows, I just, I don't, I think most people should not be using Windows computers. The guy has a Mac at home, and and he was using Windows at work, or and it's just like, don't please, don't why why buy Windows. And I'm not blaming Microsoft, really. It's uh, it's just that it's a, such a target. It's a shame. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888. Ask Leo. That's the phone number. Uh, speaking of routers, did you see this uh, whole foof -raw, uh over a router company wanting to sue a guy who reviewed it badly on Amazon.com? Amazon has kicked the router company off. For threatening, but it does bring up an interesting um, point. They may actually have had a legal case. So they wanted to sue for libel because the reviewer said things on the uh, Amazon review that he couldn't prove were true. The router company, uh, Media Bridge Products, sells a router called Media Link. Not a big name router. I'm not even, I don't even know anybody who uses it. But uh, the reviewer posted uh, a review on Amazon in which he said that the router company was making up reviews, fake, you know, putting fake reviews up, and that the router itself was not made by the company, but just a rebranded router. The attorney contacted the reviewer on Amazon. Uh, and said, we're going to sue you for libel because you can't prove either of those assertions. They're not true. Now, Amazon has revoked the company's selling privileges. The reviewer has taken down his libelous assertions. Uh, but he also posted a post on Reddit in which he said, help me, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to be sued for this review. What should I do? And uh, that kind of annoyed media bridge as well their lawyer said he's been building a campaign to harm media bridge um he wrote on amazon the the reviewer never in my life have i been so relentlessly bullied by a company <laughs> and amazon's response is to take media bridge off amazon which actually uh, is a pretty hefty penalty Nowadays, if you're not on Amazon, sometimes it's hard to sell anything at all. It brings up an important point, though. You, it, I don't, I, you know, I wonder. I, I, I guess, really, it doesn't matter where you libel somebody. If you libel them, you could be sued. What is libel? Well, I mean, if you're not a lawyer, it's complicated. But essentially, my understanding is, having worked in many a network and been told what not to do, you can express an opinion. I, I can say, Heather, you're a dumbbell. And that's not libel, believe it or not, because it's not provable one way or the other. It's not a statement of fact, it's an opinion. You could say, these media bridge routers are terrible. I hated it. You can say anything that's, that you know to be true. It didn't work in my house. I couldn't get a refund. If those things are provably true, not libel. Where you get in trouble is asserting something as a fact that isn't proved that you cannot prove true. That's libel. So if you assert without any knowledge that they've been faking the reviews, you could say, "It seems to me, it's I suspect maybe that'll let you off the hook." But uh, you can't assert as fact something that's not true. You can't prove true. They could sue you. So be careful when you write reviews. It's so important. I think you know Yelp and 
Uh, Amazon reviews are so valuable. I use them all the time. I will not buy a product without reading the reviews. But I think you got to be a little careful when you're writing those reviews. Just as I have to be careful when I'm saying things. I can say, well, I, in fact, this is what the lawyers told me. I, I could, I could, not a long time ago. I think I, I said somebody was an extortionist. And they said, now that they can sue you for. That's slander. Because it it's either a fact or not, and if it's not, then you're you're going you're going to get sued. Uh, you can say their behavior is extortion like. You could say they're dumbbells. <laughs> I hate them. Those things are all safe. So be a little. I guess we have to be careful for. Uh, even in a review, we got to be a little. You wouldn't think, but now you're in public, right? You're in public eye. So I just thought I'd mention that. And uh, and I guess kudos to Amazon for wielding their mighty power. Now, Amazon is also wielding its mighty power against a book publisher, Hachette. I don't know if you've if you've gone to try to buy a uh, Malcolm Gladwell book for instance on Amazon. He he's uh, published by Hachette. I guess Amazon and Hachette are having a little a little feud. Amazon probably, although we don't know, trying to get a, a better deal from Hachette. Hachette probably, although we don't know, saying, "Uh-uh." But for whatever reason, Amazon is saying two to three weeks delay getting these books, uh, raising the price, lowering the discount, things like that. And uh, a lot of authors are saying, this doesn't cost his shed as much as it's costing me. Um, so there's an example of Amazon wielding its power. Let me just see. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Here's Outliers, the Malcolm Gladwell book on Amazon. It says uh, this book will be available in the ships in two to three weeks. Two to two to three weeks. Hachette says, "Well, no, we they, we 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 sent we we sent them <laughs> boxes, boxes. I tell you, boxes. No, we're out of stock. Two to three weeks. Now I don't know how you prove it one way or the other, but." Uh, these things, these things can happen, and this is one of the problems. For a long time, Amazon was a godsend to publishers. It was an alternative that they could go to if Barnes & Noble or, or Borders were asking for uh, too much money. The publishers could say, well, we're just going to sell it on Amazon. Unfortunately, Amazon's been so successful that uh, most towns don't have a bookstore anymore. Do you have a Barnes & Noble? I know you don't have a Borders. They're gone. So... Barnes & Noble's, I guess, still around, but who knows for how long. Now that they've got uh, an effective monopoly in many places, Amazon can throw their weight around. So sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's nice that they throw their weight around. Sometimes maybe not so nice. 8888-ASK-LEO. Back to the phones. Uh, boy, you know, uh, I'm like, getting old. I can I'm hardly old. read I this. hardly read this. Brent in Marietta, Brent California. In Marietta, California. Hi, Brent. I'm getting a lot of echo back. I'm not sure why. Oh, hang on one second. Am I on a speakerphone? How's that? Yeah, that's better. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for taking my call. Of course. I it. Thanks for calling. Thank you. So my question is that I'm trying to set up sort of a cloud storage for my, my house. Uh, my wife and I use, uh, she uses a Mac and I use a PC. And I kind of want a central drive in the home that has our music and movies on it and things like that. Um, so I want to know what your opinions are on the network storage, the NAS storage versus like a Western digital cloud drives and things like that. They're fine. You know, um, the whole idea of an, a NAS, basically the Western digital is a NAS. The idea of a NAS is it it is a, 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 a lot of storage that is headless. It doesn't have a compu computer monitor, doesn't have a keyboard, doesn't have a mouse. You get to, it's on your network though, and you get mm -hmm. to it by surfing to it. Uh, in a browser, and you can configure it. And you know, f fancy NASes like the Synology or uh, the Netgear have more features. The simple stuff like Western Digital has fewer. I've got something I might recommend though for you. It's a little different. Okay. Hang in there after the break. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I've been using, and uh, you know, I when I first used it, I was less uh, enamored of it, but now I'm crazy about it. This transporter thing. So for 100 bucks, you buy this little puck, and then you can use any, drive, any USB drive you've got lying around, and I have a lot of them, and you plug it in, 
and then it has a Dropbox kind of sync app that run you run on your computer. Maybe this isn't perfect for you. You can, you can move stuff onto that drive, the USB drive, directly from the computer. Now, you, there's a couple of ways you can do it. You can, not, you can have that stuff synced to your computer. In your case, you probably wouldn't want to. You just would want to have it be visible. It's on the network. It's visible. But you can also use it. I've been using it as a backup. And in fact, one of the cool things you can do with this, I have one transporter at the office and another transport at home, and they, they duplicate each other. So it's kind of Dropbox without Dropbox. You, you, you have cloud storage, but it's all yours. It's kind of like the Pogo Plug. But it does stuff that I think the Pogo Plug doesn't do. Maybe not. And Jeff, yeah, so what I'm saying is you don't have to sync everything. You can keep it on the transporter as a NAS storage, but then it has a little bit of an advantage because you can, other, you can also have some folders that are syncing, like your documents. So it's like this great backup solution. And when you have two locations, it's really cool. I haven't played with the Pogo Plug lately. Let me look at what Pogo Plug does these days. See, I think Pogo Plug now you're storing, yeah, you're using their cloud, aren't you? They've kind of pivoted. There you go, Ed Porter. That's a good definition of libel. Yes. <laughs> so Johnny's on the line. From Johnny's on the ship. line from a cruise ship. Um, asked him a couple questions just to sort of test. And there's a little bit of latency. Okay. So you can gauge it how you want, but you might want to just like let him take it away. Yeah. Good as thinking. As having a full-on conversation. Good thinking, Heather Harmon. Just an idea. So uh, Transporter uses uh, strong encryption at all times, HTTPS. So... Um, your stuff is in... Oh, it's also encrypted on the transporter, I think. I'm pretty sure. So it's basically encrypted cloud storage that you control. Don't do it for 27 terabytes. <laughs> These, well, I guess you could. But again, you'd have this issue of connectivity issue. I think cloud is not good for 27 terabytes. You know what I did buy? I keep beefing up this Mac Pro. I figure I spent so much money on the Mac Pro. So I got the nice little little big drive, right? And then I just bought a 4K monitor. 31-inch 4K monitor. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. That big old jet airliner going to bring Johnny Jet, our travel guru, to us in a moment. He's on a beautiful cruise ship somewhere in the middle of nowhere. But before we do that... Oh, somebody put him on anyway. Hold on, we're <laughs> hold on Johnny. Hold on, because I'm talking to Brent and Murrieta about cloud storage. And so the Synology makes great NASes. I really like them. But I would also take a look at this transporter. I've been using this. I've used it for some time, and I think they've gotten better and better and better. They have two devices. One doesn't have any hard drive. So if you've got a USB hard drive lying around, who doesn't these days? You can plug it into this transporter puck. And it will do what you want. It'll be visible on the whole network. Uh, the puck is 99 bucks, so that's the price is right. But it has another advantage, which I really like. You can use it as cloud backup. If you have two transporters, which I do, I have one at home and one at the office, they'll securely sync with each other. Now, you don't care about that for your media files. That's, that, no. that's, that's what you don't want to do. They're, they're too big. But, but, you can, but you can separate it, say I have, I have a folder on the transporter that syncs to your computers and syncs as a backup or just as a kind of common document storage uh, to work. And I, I use it for that, and I find it really great. So this is a this is a fairly inexpensive way at 99 bucks to take if you have an old hard drive lying around, an old hard okay. drive. I think it's a good way to go. The Western Digital, very similar, uh, but you're buying, they're a hard drive company, so you're basically you're buying a hard drive from them. But it's very easy right. to use. And, you know, many routers these days have usb ports that you can connect a drive to so uh, if you're if you're getting a new router just get one that supports a, a a drive a network drive and that'll do it too the advantage of doing that is you just take that drive you copy all the media files over to it then plug it into the router and now it's visible to everybody 
Okay. That's probably. Well, do you rec- do you recommend that over like let's say because a NAS? A NAS is a lot more expensive. It'll have things like RAID to protect your data. Do you really care? No, you've got copies elsewhere, right? Right. Uh, it will have the ability to serve as a media streaming device, which you might want if you want to have an iTunes server, for instance, if you use that uh -huh. way of playing media back. But nowadays, most computers, if they see a drive on the network with media files on it, they'll play it. You don't need a special okay. server. So I think uh, for many people, NASes are overkill now. The only real reason to get a network-attached storage is for the RAID 5, for the redundancy, the ability to make a giant disk out of multiple independent disks. Uh, and if one of them dies, you can swap it out, things like that. And you pay a lot for that feature. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty expensive. Yeah. Okay. Look at well, look at the ninety nine buck transporter, or get the Western Digital, or just get a, a a router with a USB drive, USB hub. Hey, thanks for the call. I appreciate it. Look who's here. It's JJ Johnny Jet, our travel expert. He travels the world so you don't have to. No, no. He travels the world so he can learn all about it, so you can save money. Where are you today, Johnny? I'm right now. I'm sailing on Windstar, their new Star Pride ship between Elba, the island of Elba, to Rome. So I'm just going by Sardinia right now. I'm so jealous. Not too shabby. Yeah. So Windstar, uh, if I remember, these are the, they look like sailboats. They do, except this is a new ship that that does not have sails, and they actually got it from your favorite company, Seaborn. Oh. And so um, it's a it's a new ship for them. It holds uh, 212 people. Oh, that's nice. 106 suites. Oh, that's nice. I like the small you know, ships. Nice and small. They and, can go into uh, ports that like Elba that uh, big ships around, can't. But do. I got a good website of the week for you. All right, fire away. Yeah, actually, that 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 that's what it does. By the way, we started in Barcelona, then we went to some really small ports in oh. France. Oh. Canary, like Canary, but with an S. Yes. And then Sete, and then Portofino yesterday. I mean, just really nice ports and ships. Stop but, it. But uh, since we're on the ship theme, I thought we'd talk about a, a co boatbound co. Oh, you're gonna have to say it again because the. Uh, are you on a satellite phone, Johnny? I am. I'm we're on a satellite phone. We're talking to Johnny through space. Bound. <laughs> it's, and it's costing $8 a minute, so send me the bill, okay? So tell me the site again. That's right. Boat Bound. B-O-A-T-B-O-U-N-D dot C-O. C-O, not com. C-O is the... Did you get that? Yeah. Rent boats from real right. people. This is good. I always wanted to be on a boat. An Airbnb. Yeah, <laughs> I love this. They're 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 supposedly the first fully insured insured peer to peer and peer spelled P I E R. If you get the little words on play. Yeah. In a boat mark, rental marketplace in the world, so you can rent it for anything. And their whole mission is to spread the ahoy, <laughs> which is. Pretty funny. So you can start with a kayak for fifty dollars a day, or go all the way up to your own private yacht for nine hundred bucks a day. Hey, this is awesome. Yeah, so it's a great way to uh, you know you can rent a boat or you can rent out your boat if you have one, and they have um, over thirteen million registered users. Awesome, Johnny, you're on your way to Italy. Have a wonderful time. Um, I'm with my. With my dad, and we're looking forward to it. All right. And, um, At $8 right, a minute, though, I'm, I'm not going to keep you on hold, <laughs> on hold much longer. Thanks, Johnny. Enjoy your trip. It's great to talk to you. His website, johnnyjet.com, johnnyjet.com on uh, the web and on Twitter, at Johnny Jet. And he's really a great resource. I, w I hope, I wished we'd had a better connection because I wanted to ask him about booking cruises. That, you know, because you can nowadays you go online, you can book anything. But I think he, I remember him saying it's better to use a trap. That's one of the few things it's better to use a travel agent for. Tell you what, next week I'll be asking Johnny Jet about that. He has such great recommendations. One of the best travel websites and one of the nicest guys. JohnnyJet.com. Back to the phones we go. Mark, Riverside, California. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Mark. Hey, Leo. Welcome. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. Um, I just recently bought a Canon 60 camera. I'm looking for a uh, computer that would uh, that you'd recommend for 
photo editing and stuff. I'm currently using a HP computer that's older. I love going with a Mac. I have to be honest with you. Uh, yeah. Lightroom, which is the program I would recommend, works on Windows yeah, yeah. or Mac. That's a wonderful program. Um, the reason I like Mac, a couple of things. First of all, you hear people call with Windows problems all the time, especially viruses and malware. It's just unheard of on the Macintosh. And I, and I just, I see people suffering so much using Windows. I, it's hard for me to say get a, another Windows machine. Mac also has, even the laptops, better, if you get Apple monitors, better color accuracy. Unless you spend a lot of money on a, on a Windows PC and you pay special attention to the monitor. In general, the cheap monitors that come with cheap PCs are not accurate and bad for photography. Almost all the photographers I know use Macintosh. There's a f another reason that I just recently I really like, but it's going to require getting an iPad. Lightroom has now come out on the iPad. It's a free app, but of course you have to buy an iPad and you have to have Lightroom on your desktop. But for a photographer who has to go through a lot of photos, I love it what you do is you take on your desktop you take photo collections and you say share those with my ipad and you can now so when i come home and i've shot a lot of photos i can say make that a collection of my shoot today and then i can go sit down in an easy chair with the ipad and go through those photos do some basic editing which is automatically synced back to the desktop but more importantly reject and pick photos and it's a great way an ipad is a great way to sh to go through a lot of photos fast so to me the perfect setup for a photographer a macintosh desktop or laptop t uh, you know tied to uh, with lightroom tied to ipad uh, lightroom that is that is a dream setup leo laporte the tech guy. Wow. The headlines ripped straight from the headlines. The Simpsons tapped out. The government's been spying on the residents. So it says, none of those words are illegal, and I'm not here to decide right or wrong, says the judge. That's exactly what you're supposed to do, says Lisa. Man, maybe I'm not cut out for this, and... Maybe I should stop doubling myself, or doubting myself, aloud while in the midst of a case. Either way, not guilty. Now, if you'll excuse me, I've got some soul-searching to do. <laughs> so apparently Chief Wiggum had spy apparatus installed <laughs> all, all over Springfield. She's just a girl. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the number, 8888 Ask Leo, 888-827-5536. Paris is on the line from uh, Illinois, Westmont, Illinois, to be exact. Hi, Paris. Hello, Paris. Oh, wait a minute. I got <laughs> I got to push that button. Hi, Paris. Hey, can you hear me? I hear you great. Welcome. Oh, okay. Yeah, I had a question. I have the iPhone 5, and I want to see if I could... Uh, I have Sprint iPhone, and... I'm I've I've under um, after 90 days Sprint said that I could unlock my phone and I talked to them. Uh, is it possible to have a fully unlocked Sprint iPhone? If you if they unlock it, yeah. Have they unlocked it? They said they've unlocked it, but this is only international. It, they said oh that yeah, it's sneaky, only. huh? So what it is is the iPhone 5 and 5s have uh, their CDMA on the Sprint and Verizon network. But they also have an LTE chip. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, you can pop that chip out and put in a T-Mobile SIM, and I believe it will work if they really unlocked it. What, they, what they're saying to you is, well, we, unlocked the, we didn't unlock the CDMA, but we unlocked the SIM card. So if you travel overseas, you can pop in a SIM card from another country. But I'm not sure, but I would, I, if you have a friend with T-Mobile, borrow his SIM card, pop it in. Or AT and T, pop it and see if it works, and I bet it would work. My my question to you is: If they told me it only uh, like this only works internationally, is there a way to have it be fully? What is do you know? Well, I think what the, I don't know what they're saying exactly. When they say it's only international, I think what they're trying to say is we didn't unlock the CDMA part, so you couldn't just go over to Verizon and use it as a CDMA phone, but you can use it as a GSM phone because we unlocked the LTE chip, the GSM chip. 
My guess is it would work on AT&T or T-Mobile. But I wouldn't want you to, you know, go out and get an account unless you try it first. But oh, I think yeah, that's yeah. I think that's what they're saying, and that what they don't want you to know is. But by the way, it would also work with any GSM carrier. Oh, okay, then I was a bit confused. Well, I I'm not. Yeah. You're not confused. They're conf trying to confuse you. They're trying to I suspect obfuscate the fact that it will work in the United States. But mm -hmm. uh, but what they're what they're what they should say is we unlocked the GSM the LTE chip. We didn't unlock CDMA. Who do you want to move it to? I was going to T-Mobile and seeing if it would... would yeah. Blend it. I'm not sure, but I would try it with a T-Mobile SIM. You probably, the T-Mobile guys want you to move over there. They will know if it'll work or not. You try it, bring it, bring it to the T-Mobile store. Say, hey, I'm just curious. Can I use this? They unlocked it, but they said it's international only. My suspicion is that, that that'll work on T-Mobile. My opinion is the this carrier needs to be more open about unlocking policy. I know. You know, cell phone companies are, come from Monopoly, remember? They were all monopolies. <laughs> Verizon was, AT&T was, Sprint was. They were all monopolies. And so they, they don't really understand how to deal with customers. None of them deal well with customers. All of them miss kind of, they don't, I'm not saying they lie, but they don't, they don't, they misrepresent a little bit, you know, Unlimited bandwidth, unlimited, uh, you know, data, except that it's not, it's only unlimited for the first five gigabytes and then you can't really use it. But that's unlimited because <laughs> we didn't limit it. They do all do that. And I just think mm -hmm. it's a little, uh, they're, they're, they just don't, they're not used to telling the truth, I think. Yeah, you know, <laughs> there used to be a time two, three years back where if you jailbreak your phone, you would get unlocked right away. <laughs> yeah. It's not that easy anymore. Yeah. Easy. No, and, and but what they have done to their credit, both AT and T and I guess Sprint too, if you're in good standing and you've had the phone for a period of time, will unlock it for you. Um, uh, but it sounds like they they don't really tell you exactly what you can do with it. My guess is pretty, uh, but you'd have but don't get an account yet. But take it to the T Mobile store and just say, hey hey, can you can, I, can you put a SIM in here? Just I want to see if this will work because Sprint said that he unlocked it, but I don't know if it'll work. And the T Mobile guy wants you as a customer, so he'll help you out. Probably, okay, man. probably they already know because I bet you, <laughs> I bet you a lot of Sprint people come in the door. So ask them. All right. Definitely. Yeah, it's, I think it's not. They're not. It's not exactly not telling the truth. <laughs> <laughs> but you know when you say that it's not exactly lying it, it's it's something else i don't it's spinning spinning there's the word they're spinning you they're not telling you a falsehood but they're giving you a misapprehension that they, they're trying to convince you yeah but you can't use this in the u.s because they don't want you to right they don't want to lose you as a customer you can't use this in the u.s they don't say that though do they they say this is for international purposes i let me know. Would you call me back and let me know or send me an email, leo at uh, techguylabs.com, Paris. I'd like to know. By the way, you got a great name. And with a name like Paris, you should have your phones always unlocked for international use. Every time. Hey, I'm Paris. My phone's unlocked. Steve next in Torrance, California. Hi, Steve. Hi. I'm, I'm interested in getting one of these uh, internet phone company uh, things like I'm looking at this thing called UMA. Yeah. And I'm really concerned about what's going to happen with the way the recent uh, justices' decision. Well, we're waiting to see. So um, the issue is open Internet, of course. And, and both Comcast, AT&T, Verizon, they all offer phone service of one sort or another. And we've seen this happen in Canada. It hasn't happened in the U.S. yet, but we've seen this happen in Canada where Canadian internet service providers who are also phone companies make Skype work badly uh -oh. make VoIP work badly they use uh, hardware from a company called Sandvine that says oh that's a Skype call let's make that stop after 15 minutes <laughs> they make sure it doesn't work as well and I think one of the risks with VoIP is you are relying when you're using Uma or Magic Jack or Skype or Vonage you're relying on your internet service and now, do you have do you have good internet service? It's reliable, high speed. Yeah, we're with Verizon right now, and I was just thinking about attaching Uma to it and getting rid of my uh, phone. But remember, Verizon's in the phone business, so 
So they're going to hang me up. Well, they, technically they're not supposed to. In fact, it's illegal for them to. But I, you know, they seem these companies seem to be getting away with a lot lately. Is it Verizon FiOS or is it Verizon uh, DSL? We have FiOS. FiOS. Well, I mean, you know, that's plenty of bandwidth in theory. How does Skype work for you? Does it work well for you? Uh, I haven't used Skype, but Try we... Try Skype. Yeah, we, I haven't used Skype. I've used, uh, well, we FaceTime. have... FaceTime? Uh, we, we have the uh, TV service... That we use yeah, that's not a measure. What you got to do is try one of these voice over internet products. FaceTime on an Apple, Skype on any computer. That Those are both free. Tr make some calls to people who use them and see how it is. If you can live with the quality, don't use video because you're not going to need video on a phone line. Usually the phone lines work pretty well. And I don't, I don't know of anybody, I'm just, I don't know if anybody's having trouble with, uh, per se, with Verizon Fios and uh, VoIP. Uma is a very good choice. So I, I, I understand your concern, and it's at least a theoretical cause for concern, but I don't know if it is a real cause yet. Try VoIP on your line. See how it works. If you like it, go ahead. I'll tell you some negatives of VoIP right after this. Our show today brought to you by our great friends at ShareFile. I love I use them every week. I just used them today. ShareFile is how I share files. It's a good name, isn't it? With, uh, with other radio stations. So I'm always sending them audio. I'm sending them ads and so forth. And we've tried all the different ways of sharing files. And, of course, the worst way a lot of people are still using, which is attaching files to email. If you're in business, probably almost half your emails have a presentation or a contract or something attached, right? You know, I say this all the time, no email attachments. Don't, don't accept them. Don't open them. Don't send them. There, there are a lot of reasons for this. For one thing, uh, and a good, and a good reason, it's not, it's not secure. When you send a file over the internet, it's like sending a postcard. Anybody can read it. That's not good. Um, but it's also you, 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 you don't, you, you lose control of it. You don't know if it's going to bounce back. If the file's too big, a lot of email people won't accept it. Um, I just, I think there are better ways. Sometimes also attachments confuse people. Now, I have to send out so many files. If I send attachments, it would just, it wouldn't work. So I send share file. Share file is so cool. First of all, it's not an attachment. It's a secure link. Your, you know what? Let me show you how it works. I'm going to log into my share file account. Share file has synchronization software. So when I record audio or I, you know, save something to a specific file, it automatically uh, gets synchronized up to the share file cloud. In fact, you can see. This is my share file store. You see I have files in here right now. These are all files that I, I've uploaded to various people. Um, uh, you'll notice another thing. It's got my Twit logo. It doesn't have, it, it's, not, it's not share file branded. It's branded with my uh, company, which so it has a great professional look. You can give people um, permissions to access it, and I have done that. But you can also send a file. Let's say I want to send off this file. I'm going to click the send button. I get to uh, set various parameters. I can say how long that file is available for. Uh, you know, can they download it forever or for just a week? You know, when it expires. I can say how many times they can download it. I can have it email me when it's downloaded. I'll get a secure link, and that link, when I attach it to, I just send it in the email, will look so cool. This is what they see. They see my logo. They see a, a download button. They don't have to sign up for anything. I just love ShareFile. I just love ShareFile. You can use ShareFile to get files from clients, too, if you're in the business of, well, a lawyer asked us, hey, I, I need to get pictures from my clients, but they don't understand anything about, about you know, attachments and email and stuff. It's HIPAA compliant, compliant with financial industry regulations and others. you got to try it. you got to try this. Do me a favor. Go to ShareFile.com and then you, click this link up at the top, podcast listeners. Click here. Use our offer code TechGuy, one word, T-E-C-H-G-U-Y. And then you don't have to, but if you choose an industry, that's awesome because then it'll customize it and it's and it's got, you know, it's 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 designed for a variety of industries. It's by Citrix. They know how to do stuff for business. Sharefile.com. Uh, tell your boss, tell your IT guy, use it yourself. Sharefile.com, use the offer code TechGuy. You can try it free for 30 days. Love Sharefile. Love it. Hey, everybody. Welcome. Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. This is the show where we talk about computers and the Internet and home theater and 
digital photography and smartphones and all that jazz. The phone number is 888-827-5536 or 8888-ASK-LEO, if, you, if, you, if that's easier to remember. And the website is techguylabs.com. Techguylabs.com. Let's get right to the phones. Say hi to Jack in uh, Riverside, California. Hi, Jack. Hey, Leo. You there? I'm here waiting for your question because I know you got a good one. Yes, I do, sir. I used to listen to you back on the um, screensavers. Yeah, you didn't. You, you had to think for a second. Yeah, I know. Me it's too. It's been a long time. <laughs> the show. I the show. I left the show in 2004. So it's ten years ago. Man, you ought to start it again. You guys have made a big impact in my life. If only there were some way we could broadcast content about technology over the internet. It would just be so... Wait a minute, we do. There's a network. It's called twit.tv. We do 30 hours of screensavers-like programming every single week. And I'm on half of it. So tune in. Yeah. Twit.tv, that's my podcast network. What can I do I for you? I'm a commission, but I got a question. I need <laughs> for... Actually, I got two quick questions. But okay. My main question is, the wife and I are going to Cancun at the end of the month. She wants to get an uh, underwater camera. Uh, trying to see there's all kinds of stuff out there. I'll tell you the one I used, and I was very happy. It's very affordable. It's from Olympus. It's called the TG. I think of the TG2 is the one I have. Now, it's a point-and-shoot, but you don't. You can take it underwater. I, I mean, she's not going to dive 20 feet, is she? No, we're just going to go, like, swim with the dolphins yeah. or sharks or whatever. Yeah, that's what I used it for. It's And it's also a tough camera, which is nice because you can drop it. You, you know, it's great for traveling. It shoots both stills and uh, video. It's quite good looking. Uh, I've, I've been very happy with it. Uh, now, uh, I see it uh, on eBay for 250 bucks. I see it in other places for a little more, like 330 But it's in that it's in that price range. They have it in a variety of colors. I have the bright red one, so I wasn't didn't want to lose it. 12 megapixels. It's not. It's a point and shoot. But if you get a bigger camera like a DSLR, you have to get a special dive housing, and by then you've spent a lot of money. So this is this is the way I would go. And I boy, I love this camera. Great video too. I was really pleased with the video. Olympus O L Y M P U S T G two, and I've recommended it to several people. In fact, when my daughter went down to Mexico uh, for a couple of months to study uh, Spanish, um, I said, "Hey, take this with you because, you know, it's 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 you can bang it around. The images are phen phenomenal, much better than a camera phone, but not much bigger than a camera phone. It's very compact. Uh, when you turn it off, that covers up the lens so dust doesn't get in it's got now the only negative on all the waterproof and the dust proof cameras they've got rubber seals around all the connectors but as far as a camera goes it works great unfortunately she just got back a week ago and i said how'd that camera work out she said great i said can i have it back she said no <laughs> she's keeping it that's all right that's all right i don't have to worry about her dropping it off or the uh, edge of a boat or anything Lance, Los Angeles, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Lance. How are you? Bienvenue. Bienvenue. Como ça va? There you go. Very good. Very good. Très bien. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, ask a, a question about a missing ic uh, drive icon on the desktop. And uh oh, uh, yeah, it's one of those. It's. I know you talk about backing up and uh, for for a long, long time. Do you think the drive is missing or just the icon? The well. <laughs> That's what's interesting. Um, I'm running Mac. Um, and it's, now, now, you know there are settings in the Finder as to whether or not you show drive icons. Yes. No, this is, it's always been there. I have oh, okay. all that set up. And just all, all so when you open a Finder window, when you open a Finder window and you go to the Go menu, you can't even see it there. Uh uh, right, this is this is Mac, so it's just it's on the desktop yeah. all the time. No, I understand, but you know, yeah. if you open a window. Uh, the Finder, you know, that's that. Oh, thing. Yes, yes, yeah, it's not there. Yeah, right, and right, and you yeah. go to the Go menu on the Finder, will list all of the different. That's right. Not yeah. There. In fact, if you go to my, if you go to the computer, you might have right. to press the Option key. You should see all the drives attached. And you're saying it doesn't show up there. Doesn't there? Been there. Is been it there for two years? And I woke up boom, one morning and it wasn't gone. there. It wasn't is it a USB drive, drive or an internal drive? This is an external USB okay. uh, uh, Western Digital My Passport one okay. terabyte drive. So first thing to do is get, try a different cable. Okay, did that. Did that. Exactly. All right. Did all the normal try different port. Did that. Okay. I have two or three have running. You, have you they, tried it on a different computer? Uh, yes. 
No, no dice. You don't see anything. No dice, right? Okay. So then, so, okay. So I open up disk utility. Yeah. And it shows it, but it's not. It's dimmed out somehow. It's not completely bright as the other ones. It shows. Yeah, it's unmounted. Okay. So then I click. It says, "Click repair disk." And then I click that, and it spins around for about forty minutes, and then it says, "Repair failed." Yeah. Please reformat. Yeah. So then you click reformat. No. Oh, gosh. You did? Well, yeah, but this time it was okay. It was okay. Because right. okay. Okay. <laughs> that erases everything. That yeah. erases everything. I but you don't care. You just want the drive to work. I want the drive to There's work. nothing on it you need. Well, there kind of was. This was this is one of my backup drives, but it's okay because I have, as you have good. always counseled, always have more than one. Right? Good. All right. So, yeah, no, that's good. Well, at least this isn't a crisis. It's not like there's something on there that you can't afford to lose. It does sound like the drive itself has gone to the drive in the sky, the big drive heaven. <laughs> yeah, the big drive garage in the sky. Um, there are a couple of things that can go wrong with external drives. That could be just the enclosure, the mm -hmm. power supply in the enclosure, the circuitry in the enclosure. So sometimes it's worth taking the drive out. It's usually just a couple of screws. Take right. the drive out and see if you can mount it another way. Um, and I if that's that. the case, then it, that. oh, you did that. Oh, you're way ahead of me. Yeah. And it still didn't mount. It's, it, well, it's interesting because it, it when you click reformat, it says unable to reformat, un unable to unmount. Yeah, yeah. This well, is this. And it goes. You go through this endless loop. Of, yeah, this of happens on Macintoshes. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes the drive partitions can get corrupted, and it mounts it right uh, read only. And I suspect yeah. this is a read only drive. Well, I guess it is now. Yeah. <laughs> But okay, if, so you it, have, if you can see it, if you can see it several times, I yeah. finally did it. Yeah. And it said, this is reformatted. Ah. It's great. And I plugged it in and now there's nothing. It still doesn't it, matter. It won't even, it won't even see it. Yeah. I don't think it ever really did. Yeah. I think that's called a, I think it's gone to the, it's a dead, it's a dead drive. It's, that's just, that's yeah. just part of what you say, how drives fail. And that's what I'm yeah. experiencing. Yeah. Well, you did all the things I would suggest, which is eliminate any possible cause except the drive. And at this yeah. point, yeah, I think it's a dead drive. It's not expensive to replace them. You didn't lose any data. Um, no, I'm just curious as how to, how to trouble. If, there's, if uh, you had a like Windows wrong, machine, it would be yeah. worth, you know, getting an interface that could plug it in. I've recommended these before. They're 40 or 50 bucks. Newer tech sells a drive interface that lets you take this drive out of the enclosure and make it a USB drive that'll work on Windows. Plug it into a Windows machine and maybe run a, a program like Spinrite on it just to see if you can figure out uh -huh. where the drive is failing. But it, it's kind of hard to know. It sounds like, is it an SSD? It's a, it's a spinning drive, isn't it? It's a it's a solid state drive. Oh. It's, it's a it's a it's a USB uh, my passport Western Digital. It's not solid state, is it? No, I mean it spins. It spins, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't think it was solid state. All right. No, no right. I, I I used the wrong term, but yeah. it's self enclosed. It's almost yeah, like, yeah. It's a it's, but it's a, but you can unscrew it and take it out of there. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, you know, the Mac doesn't give you a lot of access to it. What you want is something that'll see low level, see that there's a physical media there. And then right. low-level format it. And I, I would generally use uh, uh, Windows to do that. Do you have access to a Windows machine anywhere? Not offhand. Yeah, no. don't worry about it. The, yeah. the thing I was talking about, the universal drive adapter. Look, if you, yeah. know, if you want to bring it into a shop, they could do this too. The universal drive adapter lets you hook it up to a PC. And then there, there are better recovery tools available on the PC. But at this point, I'd say just get a new one. They're not that expensive. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. And look who's here. Direct from Boulder, Colorado, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Henry Laporte. Come on over here, Henry Laporte. Do you want money? It broke even worse? Oh, no, that's bad. What, did you drop it? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'd say that's not going to work. Okay, but do you think I could just go get it fixed or should I just get a new one? What is this? What is this thing falling out? I don't know. Yeah, that's the camera. Oh, you got just got a text. Know, sucks. <laughs> yeah, take it over them. Usually they'll fix it while you wait. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Thanks, Dad. How you doing? Good. You having fun with your buds? Yeah, you're doing a fun show. So. <laughs> I make faces during this show. Um, let's see here. Guillermo in Whittier, California is next. Hi, Guillermo. Hi, Guillermo. Leo, Leo Laporte, Laporte, the tech guy. 
Uh, hi, um, I'm Daniel uh, Guillermo's son. Um, oh, just, good. That's fine. Yeah, I'll talk I, to anybody yeah. in the family. Is your mother there? Your brother? Anybody? Uh, my my dad's busy, but I, I figured I'll talk to you. I'll explain. What can I do for you, Daniel? Yeah. Um, about a computer about yeah about a month ago, uh, a new a new Dell, and um, so the first thing we did we had it running on our old monitor, and um, we had it through the what is it AVG or VGA cable? VGA, yeah. Yeah, a VGA, and um, it, it worked for a day or two, and then um, it it wouldn't respond. So we just figured it was the cable. We had another cable, and then um, we plugged it in, and nothing nothing came out. So we we had an we had the exact same monitor somewhere else in, in the garage. We plugged that one in, and it wasn't working. So we figured it wasn't the monitor. So the only way uh, we got it to work was through uh, HDMI on on, on yeah. the TV. Yeah. So actually, you want to use the HDMI if you can, because it's better quality. Yeah, but um, I, th I think there's something wrong with uh, the the video processing or something because um, we have the we decided to like uh, you know how the power supply tends to go bad you know turning it off and on all the time or whatever we decided to you know just keep it on sleep and just uh, switch uh, the input mode on the TV when we wanted to watch TV. But ah, so you're you're con you're controlling your TV with this as well as a computer. Yeah, yeah, we have we ha we have the TV running as a monitor, but sometimes well, I'll watch TV, so we got to change it back to the TV input, and um, so we put it to sleep. You know, there's a little button you just push yeah. sleep, and yeah. um, after like if we leave it alone for like an hour, we try to go back. Um, the computer responds; it turns on back, like like it turns back on the mouse has the yeah, little light. but it's the monitor's not waking up. Yeah, it says uh, no input. So yeah, we'll this is not unusual. I think that you're what you're trying to do with this TV is not exactly what the computer wants you to be doing. You can drive a regular computer monitor over the HDMI port, right? I'm sorry. Can, can, oh, um, like like uh, what are you what are you driving with the HDMI? Connector, the TV or another computer? The, monitor? It's it's a it's a TV. It's a TV. Yeah. But, um, and it does. And you don't have a problem with HDMI? No, we were probably going to get a, a new monitor, uh, like an H, HD monitor. But um, generally, TVs make lousy, lousy computer, computer monitors. monitors. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're that's we were just using this because uh, we didn't have anything else. Right. Right. But um, when we when we put it to sleep. I don't think there's anything wrong with the computer. I think that it's a mismatch between the monitor you're trying to use and the computer. The monitor is not waking up when the computer is trying to wake it up. Yeah, so what we have to do, we have to turn off the computer and then turn it back on. Or? Uh, we, we tried un unplugging it. And, you know, it, it did you try unplugging the uh, cable and turning the, mon the monitor off and on? Yeah, we... we that didn't work either. Huh? No. We, we, yeah, this is not unusual. Sleep mode's always a little tricky, and I don't think the hand... This is called a handshake issue. The connection between the computer and the monitor, they handshake to say, Hi, computer, I'm monitor, monitor, hi, I'm computer. And then they agree on how they're going to talk to each other. But with a TV, it, it's, the computer may not really get the message about exactly how to communicate with the TV. Um my my suspicion is that there's nothing wrong with the computer. The computer seems operates fine with normal monitors. It uh it operates uh, uh it just it's it operates fine until it goes to sleep. That's just a that's just a, a not an unusual thing. The TV, for instance, doesn't expect a source that's going to go to sleep. It's a TV. What you went to sleep? What are you talking about? I don't understand such a thing. Blu-ray players don't go to sleep. Why do you go to sleep? So that it's it's just that it doesn't have the capability of 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 getting it to wake up. I just I don't think it's the computer. I wouldn't worry about it. Tell tell your dad. Leo says it's all right. It's not the computer. It's just the the monitor you're using is suboptimal, and it's just not waking up. Don't let it go to sleep. Danny in Redlands, California. You're next. Hi, Danny. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, Leo, thanks for the show. Sure, thanks for calling. What can I do for you? Uh, is there a Chromebook that uh, you can um, boot from flash drive? Uh, well, all Chromebooks do boot from flash drive, but the internal drive, I presume you mean over the, can boot from a USB drive. Yeah, I don't think so. Like yeah. No, I don't USB think so. Drive. Why do you want to do that? Because I want to use um, uh, Ubuntu on it. Ah, yeah, there are ways to use Linux on a Chromebook. Not too difficult, but uh, 
you'll have to use uh, something, uh, some special software you download. It's actually a guy at Google who made it possible. You cannot just boot up a Chromebook into Linux. Um, oh. Yeah, no, that's that's not. I don't think they even enable that capability. That oh. part of the reason they do that is they don't. That the whole the whole point of the of a Chromebook is to be safe, secure, and simple, and they don't want you running other operating systems on that hardware. What you should do is look at something called Crouton, which is a lovely thing in a salad, but even better if you want to run Linux, uh, Ubuntu Linux on a Chromebook. Uh, like I said, it's created by a guy who works, I think he works on the Chromebook team. He's a Googler. And uh, Crouton is uh, on GitHub. If you search for Crouton, you'll find a number of articles on how to install Linux on a Chromebook. I don't personally think, you know, if you buy it, are you do, did you buy it because it's cheap? Yes. Yeah. Well, it's limited. <laughs> <laughs> it's limited. And uh, a lot of people I know run Linux on it. I put Crouton on my Chromebook, and it works great. Uh, it's not super ideal, but... Um, so, so how, how does that work? Well, with the Chrome, you uh, download with the you download Crouton and install it on the Chromebook. I'll tell you what, I'll put a link in the show notes to a uh, Lifehacker article that says how to do it. It's pretty straightforward. Okay. You have to put the Chromebook in a developer mode, things like that. But it's not, It's uh, look, I've done it. It's not too complicated. It, my friend Jeff Jarvis, who is far from a geek, has done it. So you can do it. Okay. Chromebooks are, you know, they, they're actually perfectly capable of running Linux. In fact... The Chrome OS is based on Linux, um, but I think that Google kind of doesn't, they, they don't want to sell them as general purpose computers. They want to sell them as secure, simple computers that don't do a lot of stuff. Okay. But I think for a hacker, and you're definitely one, uh, it's a great thing to do. Put, put Crouton on it. You can go back and forth between Crouton and Ubuntu and, uh, and the regular Chrome OS. Uh, so you get all the capabilities of Linux. But remember, it's a small hard drive. Um, you know, there there are some limitations of that hardware. But, I, yeah, you can do it. C-R-U-C-R-O-U-T-O-N. Crouton. Look it up. Uh, and uh, I'll put a link, as I uh, mentioned in the show notes, techguylabs.com to how to do that. It's pretty easy. 8888-ASK-LEO, the website, as I said, techguylabs.com. A great thing for you to know about. Keep it as a resource. You don't have to write anything that I'm saying down. You don't have to, you know, uh, keep it anywhere. Just techguylabs.com. We'll put it all up there for you. More of your calls right after this. Hey guys, where are you from? from Seattle. Pardon me? Seattle. Beautiful Seattle. Yeah. And you're here for fun or yeah, vacation? San and awesome. Well, thanks for coming by. I appreciate it. No, no, you're just dragged along. It's okay. I understand. <laughs> he just dragged you along. Oh, fun. Oh, fun. So you both went to Disneyland? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. That's awesome. Well, we're going to do a pilot of a new show in about half an hour. The show is called I'd Fund That. And we're getting some... I know, it sounds dirty, doesn't it? And we're getting some uh, some uh, crowdsourced... Pro That's why we call it that. I'd Fund That. I got it. You got it, finally. I'd so fund that. I'd so fund that. <laughs> That's what we should have called it. So we're gonna they they're gonna give us a demonstration of their uh, of their crowdsourced project, and then we'll give them some feedback. And Lisa's gonna be the Simon Cowell. Ooh, she's gonna be mean. I'm gonna be J Lo. I love it. <laughs> you are a hit. I I I really I'm kind of I want to get home because the new People magazine uh, with with the Kim Kardashian's wedding just came out and I'm dying to see that but hmm. they said it was a disaster. Oh really? Well, I'm sure we can see it online, right? Oh yeah, probably. Sorry, but <laughs> our show today brought to you by those wonderful people at Prosper.com. Prosper is kind of a neat idea. It is a Silicon Valley's answer to. Uh, 
to lending to the big banks, you know. At Prosper, you can borrow up to $35,000 in 72 hours, and you can get your quote within minutes right now if you visit prosper.com. It's peer-to-peer -peer lending. So they it's a marketplace that brings together people with money to lend with people who want to borrow money. What would you do if you thought, gosh, I could have $35,000 in the next three days? Maybe that big remodel or maybe just start a business? Pay off those high-rate credit cards. That's the first thing you ought to do. Fill out an easy online application. Provide a few details. You'll see your rate almost instantly. It will not affect your credit score. I like that. Low fixed-rate loans. They're unsecured personal loans. You don't need any collateral with multi-year terms available. Prosper is phenomenal. More than 2 million members now, lenders and borrowers alike. And over $1 billion in funded loans. Visit Prosper.com. They're offering Twit viewers a $50 Amazon gift card when you get a loan. Go to Prosper.com slash Twit, a special site just for our listeners. Up to $35,000 in three days and a $50 Amazon gift card when you get the loan. Prosper.com. Not affiliated with Amazon. For gift card details, visit Prosper.com slash Twit. And we thank Prosper for their support of the Tech Guy podcast. Ah, musical director Nathan Staten back. You could tell the great music. Thank you, Nathan. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888. Ask Leo's the number. Our show today brought to you by my good buddies at stamps.com. You can get postage on demand, you know, right from your computer and your printer. You don't have to go to the post office. Just use stamps.com. I've got a special offer. Visit stamps.com. Click the mic at the top on the right and use my name, Leo. Stamps.com. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Jose in uh, Buena Park, California. Hi, Jose. Hi, Leo. How are you? I am well. How are you? I'm doing fine. Thank you for answering my call. I have a question for you. Um, trying to put some speakers on a game room, actually in my garage. My wife was so kind to let me. Uh, <laughs> there. I'm, uh, you've moved into the garage. I completely understand. Good idea. Call it the game room. I like it. Okay. <laughs> and um, I have a 55 TV uh, Sony, so the TV, I think, is good enough. I have good. the session three. Yep. But uh, I'm debating on the surround sound. I would like to get the Bose uh, for 599 comes with two speakers and a boombox or whatever it's called. Uh, between that one and the or something um, around, that, around that price uh, with the Yamaha or speaker or something. Uh, you really want, especially because you're going to game... If you can get a nice surround sound system, it's great for movies. Because you're in the garage, it's going to be easy because you can, you know, you could take it over. It's not like the living room. You don't have to worry about wires and stuff. You could take it over. You can have great surround. I don't think you need 7-1. I think 5-1 is perfect. Subwoofer is very important. Get a good subwoofer. Do not get bows. Do not. Do not get bows. No highs, no lows. That's bows. Uh, I think uh, Bose, not my favorite. I think it's a great brand name, but I don't think it's the best sound, and it's definitely, definitely not your best bang for the buck. Now, our uh, our home theater guy, Scott Wilkinson, was, and, and the chat room is going to help me out because I don't remember the name of this, but I think it was a Pioneer uh, home theater uh, system on New Egg, and I'm just trying to remember the uh, designation. Because it was it was designed by one of the great designers and it was an amazing price for a, a, a system. I think, you know, we're talking three or four hundred bucks, less than the Bose. I was that's right. It was an Andrew Jones designed system. Let me see if I can find this. Please. Uh, the SB twenty three W is that right? No, I don't know. Uh, let me look here. Um, they they have a, actually quite a range. Uh, ranging from now, you can go all the way up to uh, five hundred bucks, four eighty nine. But I wouldn't be. Uh, I mean, that's going to sound ten times better than the Bose. That's tower speakers is going to be much better uh, quality. Um, but I, let me see if I can find this here. That that was one of them, though, wasn't it? That that uh, don't get a sound bar. Let me look and see if I can find this. Andrew Jones Pioneer. Just trying to find the model number for you. Please, I'll, I would really appreciate it. Yes, I, you know, uh, he is one of the great s sound designers, and he's designed some very inexpensive uh, systems. Um, I see several of them.
I see several of them. But probably the five one you want is the SPPK22BS. Well, that's a nice name. Easy to remember. <laughs> it's worse than a license plate. Yeah, just remember the, tw the, the 22 BS. Or if you can afford a little more, the, tw the 52 FS. These are 5 1 systems. They have everything you need. Uh, and I think they will sound so good. And having a good low base. Is it a cement floor in the uh, garage? Yes, but we put carpet on it. Great. So we, we and get that I, get that subwoofer maybe in a corner there. You're going to rock that place. That'll wow. show. That'll show your wife. <laughs> game room. I got a game room. <laughs> you're going to love it. I think the bows are overpriced. For the same amount of money you spend for the bows, you're going to get a much nicer system from. Uh, get that Pioneer, um, and uh, and and the Andrew Jones model. The chat room's giving me some links. Let me see if I can. I can find. It. I'll tell you what. We'll put those. We'll put those links in the chat room. Yeah, I think this is the one that was a good deal. The SB23W. Uh, oh no, that's a sound bar. I actually don't recommend this one. Okay. I, I do not recommend it. Get the get the. You want all the speakers. You want left, right, center, two two surrounds, and a and a subwoofer. That's five speakers plus the subwoofer is five point one. You will you will be very very happy. Thank you, Leo. Can you repeat the second? Well, both both um, uh, the brand name is Pioneer. Pioneer is the brand name. And uh, if you go to Pioneer's website and look for Andrew Jones, he's the designer. He's made a number of different systems for them. But I think you're just going to be so much happier, so much happier uh, than than getting the Bose system. And by the way, that that's just start you out with the Bose system. You still have to get some more things, I think, to make that really work. You may, with the Andrew Jones, want to get a AV receiver as well. Onkyo, O-N-K-Y-O, or Denon, D-E-N-O-N, -N, are very good and affordable. Uh, they'll give you a great sound. Now you're going to rock. Now you can have a dance party in there. you got the sub. Man, you watch movies. Forget that. You're never leaving the garage. Thank you, Jose. Good luck. Don in Mojave Valley, Arizona. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. How are you doing, Leo? I'm great. How are you, Dom? All right. I was an iPhone user. I jailbroke it because, you know, I had a visual problem. It was really good for that. Now good. I switched over to the Galaxy Note 2. Okay. And I want to uh, figure out how to get my music onto SD card so the Note will read it. I hooked up the computer. and The key is if you bought music in the well. iTunes store with copy protection, you need, need to get rid of that. But if it's more recently purchased, they dropped copy protection a few years ago. So do you know, are these copy protected? Are they a, uh, 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 do they have copy protection on them or not? No, this is, I want to transfer MP3s off of my home computer onto the Note. You no, know, I understand. I'm just asking the format. So if you didn't buy them at the iTunes store, if they're just plain... No, I didn't. Yeah, they're plain old MP3s, no problem. Just copy them over there. Uh, okay. I'll tell you, the, the recommendation I'd probably give you is to get... You, you know, the Samsung comes with a music player. It will see, you know, it will see that music. In fact, best thing to do to help you with that is uh, is to put one song on that thing through the phone, maybe download a song, and see where it puts it. You'll have the choice of putting it on the SD card. It'll create, I believe it creates a music folder. And once you've got the folder, then you know exactly what folder to put the stuff into. There you go. There's also a great program called Double Twist, which works on the Mac. It's, uh, it goes on both your phone and on the Macintosh, and it allows you to use Wi-Fi syncing. So you can have all your... PC. Oh, you got a PC. Double Twist works there, too. allows you to work okay. to, to do a Wi-Fi syncing, and that's really okay. nice. I just assumed because you were using an iPhone, you were using a Mac. Dumb of me. No, of me. sorry. <laughs> that was dumb. Double Twist works on both sides, and it's great, and it's free. All right, thank you, sir. Now, that, that simplifies it, but yeah, you can. The thing is knowing what the file structure is, you know, knowing where the Samsung phone expects music to be. And I should probably just look, but I'm betting it's just a, f a folder called music uh, on the root uh, directory of the SD card, just the music folder. But they've, you know, sure way to do it is to download a song on the phone using the music player. Look where it put it on the SD card and put everything else there, and it'll find it all. Opens it up, plays it. And since they're not copy protected, nothing to worry about. If you'd had copy protected music that you'd bought 
and the iTunes store, uh, then it's worth getting the $25 iTunes match. It's $25 for one year. You could take all of those copy protected songs and replace them with high quality, unprotected music now, which is nice. It's very nice. Uh, moving on to George in Encino, California. Hi, George. You're next. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Yeah, how are you, sir? I'm well. How are you? Uh, fine, thanks. Fine. Thanks for, thanks for taking my call. Uh, I bought a uh, recently D-Link N300 uh, router, yep. and I'm trying to hook up through, uh, to it through USB Epson uh, printer, and uh, it doesn't recognize the USB. Oh, i got to take a break. Hang on. We'll be right back. Leo Laporte, the tech one. Just checking to make sure it supports a printer. It may not. It may not. Well, I'll, I'll find out in a second here. But first, I want to tell you what to do with your old stuff. We'll have more Tech Guy in a moment. But first, a word from gazelle.com. G-A-Z-E-L-L-E.com. -L -L That's the place to sell your used stuff. If you're like this man here and you have a white mustache, what the heck is going on there? And if you have, oh, did your mustache suddenly get white? Uh, over about the past four or five months. I just noticed. Yeah. It looks very white. Maybe it's, it's the camera. It's No, <laughs> it's pretty white. It's a little dark in the center, but otherwise, I gave it two coats. And <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever use Gazelle? I have not yet. Oh, Dick, you must have more. Well, you know what Dick you know, does? Everything I, yes, everything I want to get rid of is so old, Gazelle. I keep getting, <laughs> are you kidding? He puts it in the <laughs> warehouse and then pays That's rent. Yeah. There's only you and Dvorak, the only two people I know who actually rent spaces for their old gadgets. Do not be yes. like this man. Go exactly. to, go to gazelle.com <laughs> and get rid of it before it's worthless. You know, that gadget, that old phone, the Samsung phone, the tablet, the iPod, the iPad, they're not gaining in value. As time goes by, they're getting less and less. So if you maybe you went out and you bought the new iPad Air and you put the old iPad in the closet and say, well, someday somebody will want this. No, yeah, somebody does. Gazelle, 215 bucks. That's what they... Now, this quote I just got on my old iPad, that's good for 30 days. So you can even do... You know, don't feel like you're committing. You know, you're not obligated to getting rid of it. Got an old... Like, you know, Henry's uh, old iPhone that he brought in. I can, I could even sell them that. They'll buy broken iPhones and iPads. But let's say we had... It was an iPhone 5, 64 gigs from AT&T. Good condition? Not exactly, but let's pretend it was. 225 unlocked? That gets you a whole new 5S. 185 base price? I tell you. They even tell you how to unlock it. G A Z E L L E dot com. Once you have enough stuff, press the get paid button. They'll send you a prepaid box. Postage is paid on everything worth more than a buck. If you forget to wipe the data, don't worry. Their experts will do it. They'll turn it around fast with cash, a PayPal credit, or if you're an Amazon guy, if you buy a lot of stuff on Amazon, Get that Amazon gift card. They'll bump it up 5%. They even buy old iPods. You got a Nano? This can't be worth very much. I'm just curious. Seventh generation iPod Nano. Fully working. With all the buttons intact. No personalization. What, $10, I bet. Nine. <laughs> hey, it's better than nothing. It's better than gathering dust. Better than paying rent. G-A-Z-E-L-L-E. Gazelle.com. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. We were talking to George in Encino. He's got a, a router. It's a you said the N three hundred D Link. Yeah, and an NC three hundred. Does yeah. it do? Does it say it's a printing that it share a printer share? Mm. Just because it has a USB port doesn't mean it shares a printer. Oh, I see. Out. Yeah, I think that in most cases that's for a hard drive, and I'm just looking at the site and I don't see that it shares a printer. So the most of the time nowadays, what people do is they buy wireless printers. You have an old Epson that doesn't do that. Mm -hmm. um, there are ways to do it. Um, you can buy a ninety-nine dollar uh, X Print server from Lantronics. You can, that'll actually put your printer on the network, turn it into a network printer. Um, that's probably the least expensive way. Some routers do support printers, but not all. Just because they have a USB port does not mean that it supports a printer. And as far as I can tell, I'm looking at the website for the uh, N300. I know I don't see the word printer in there. It's that USB port is in all likelihood just for a shared drive. 
8888 uh, Ask Leo. That's the number. Oh, my goodness. Look who's here. The fabulous Dick T. Bartolo, Mad Magazine's maddest writer for many a moon. Hello, Dickie D. Leo, how you doing, pal? He joins us every week to talk about gadgets. Yes, sir. We and I have a fun gadget. I was at the National Hardware Show. You know, you've only every year you bring back really interesting stuff from that. You wouldn't think they'd have gadgets. You know what? The National Hardware Show, I didn't find one tool. <laughs> but I found, <laughs> it's I not found about tools stuff anymore. For, stuff for babies, stuff for painting, stuff for the house. And this was kind of the buzz of the show. I, I mean, it, it's not like 30,000 press people, uh, you know, like, like at CES. There are maybe 30 people of uh, press people. But people were talking about, and I'll tell you what it is, and you tell me what you think of it, because I don't own a car. I've never owned a car. But there's a company called iKeyless, and at the I hardware Keyless. show, iKeyless, who says they are the world's largest retailer. Oh, they have the Swedish meatballs. I love iKeyless. <laughs> no, no. no? The no, furniture with you put... Oh. <laughs> that's Ikea. iKeyless makes uh, the keyless until you remote controls oh. for cars. Oh. So what they have come out with is a universal car remote. <laughs> this sounds like such a bad idea. Oh, really? Oh, <laughs> well, you walk down the street and you press it and all the cars open up? No, no, no. When oh. you lose your remote for your car. Oh, you know, that's expensive. Yes. If you if you have your, you know, remote on a key, like yes. like my Ford has the remote, it's like 315 bucks to get a new key. Yes. So they are making a universal car remote. Like that's it. coming out in about three months. That will sell for forty nine ninety five. And and the, I presume they say which cars it works with. Yes, they. It is almost all cars really? made between nineteen ninety five and two thousand and. And how do you key it? How do you code it into the car? So Leo, this is you know I don't totally understand any of this. So you 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 put there's a a, a code you get from evidently. That comes with the car or something. Yeah. So you go in, you go in, you put your key in the ignition, you go off to ignition eight times, <laughs> then you p press any button on the universal car yeah, remote yeah, within yeah. twenty seconds. Yeah, yeah. And it now has all the codes for your horn You're unlocking kidding. door, doing the lights. Uh, they are at universalcarremote.com. Wow. And. And, and you know, I I, I I put a tweet out on this, and someone said, "Now you tweet me." My brother just spent two hundred and fifty yeah. dollars yesterday. They're really expensive. So this company should do really well. They you said that they cover one thousand eighty vehicles, and the list and all the compatibility is at Universal. Uh, car so it's like a, it's like one of those universal TV remotes for a car. That's exact. That's exactly what they say uh, in the press release. If you can program a, a TV remote, and and there in, in that orange box is now is are they how, selling? It looks like they're trying to sell to locksmiths and people. Do they sell you know to end they, users? They, they, or? They're doing yes the, to the end user. End user, it's forty nine ninety five. But if you want to be a dealer, you should contact them, right, right. and they will make other deals with you. Universalcarremote.com. This is a good idea whose time is It's pretty come. neat, isn't it? Yeah. I have overpaid yeah. for – I lose my keys a lot. Yeah, I mean, I may buy one because I don't have a car, but it seems like a good buy. I'm telling you, and you I, get one, you just walk down the street, and the cars all come on. You're good. You're golden. They, you, oh, yeah. Which car do you want? Do you want <laughs> let's take a smaller car. Let's <laughs> – yeah. So anyway. as as Big Ginge yeah. points out, you have to have access to the ignition because you have to do that eight times thing. Yes, you yes, can't yes. just walk down the street and do it. No, and I want to thank Big Ginge in our chat room because he sent me a Mr. Potato Head. Oh, good. Yeah, that was nice of him. Good. Apparently, he heard my sad story about how when I was eight years old, I collected box tops from cornflakes and sent it in and never got a Mr. Potato Head. And that's made me bitter for the rest of my life. That's why I'm such a bitter old man. And he does not know that you pull the scam every year with a different <laughs> item that you want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I know. Four years ago, I never had Lionel trains. If only, <laughs> if only I had a universal yeah. car remote. 
Dickie D, stick around. Actually, don't. We're not going to do the Giz Fizz today. You no, know that, uh, right? Actually, John was saying, why don't you just, I'm just going to talk to the chat Just room do a mini for, fizz. A mini fizz while you set up stuff. Yes, because we're going to do a so there's special. No, no celebrity of the week and no. All yeah. right. All right. We're going to do a special show after the radio exactly. show. A, a, a pilot program we're going to try out. Oh, wow. If you visit, oh, yeah. If you visit gizwiz.biz. You will see Dickie D, and you will see all the stuff he talks about and the What the Heck Is It contest, a chance to win an autographed copy of Mad Magazine. All you have to do is identify this little Smurf saw wheel, tell us what it really is, or make up a clever, creative answer. He's got Mad Magazines for both, autographed by Dickie D. Gizwiz.biz. Thank you, Ricardo. We'll talk again next week. Time for one more, I think. Let's see. Uh, Dara is in San... I'm sorry, Deborah. Deborah's in San Diego. Hi, Deborah. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Leo. It's nice to listen to you. It's great to talk with you. Well, good. Yeah, I'm sorry. It takes so long to get to each call. I apologize. Thanks for your patience. You're welcome. I'm looking for a really good split. I don't like the iPad. I have it. It, it doesn't work any longer correctly. So I've been looking at the Dell Venue 11 Pro, okay. and I actually had an order set up, but they delayed me for two months and said they don't even make that right now. <laughs> so then I went and looked at the Surface Pro 2. That's where I'm at. And so I was hoping to get your suggestion on the right product for me. Well, let me uh, tell me why you didn't like the iPad. I want, I'd like a keyboard. Okay. I do like mobile broadband capability. It's not necessary, but I would like to have that there since the technology is there. Okay. Um, even if you suggested a laptop, because I may have tunnel vision looking at these things, I was hoping 128 gigabyte. This is from research I've done, but since I'm at a loss now. Well, you know, I mean, when you're talking the Surface Pro 2, you're talking a lot of money now. It's twice as much as a Macintosh, and it's Windows. You understand that? That's, yeah, that's what I'm looking for is Windows. Yeah. Um, it also, I don't think they yet, uh, oh, yeah, they do. They just started offering the LTE version. All right, that's good news. Uh, that means you can use it on uh, the uh, data network for your cell carrier. Um, on the Surface Pro 2? Yeah. And this, well, it looks like, yes. Okay. Yes, it looks like uh, both the Surface 2 and the Surface Pro. So there's a little confusion because of the Microsoft's naming. The Surface 2 is not a full Windows. It's their Windows RT, their limited version of Windows. Uh, but you get better battery life. It costs a little bit less. I think that's a very good choice. That's basically a PC. Surface Pro 2. Yeah, I think it's a good way to go if, if that's what you're looking for. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Thank you. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy show for today. I'm Leo Laporte. Thank you so much for joining us. Don't forget, the Tech Guy is just the tip of the iceberg. We do nearly 30 shows now on the Twit Netcast Network, and you'll find them all at twit.tv. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPad on iPad Today. You get your daily dose of tech news from Tech News Today in our weekly roundtable show, This Week in Tech. It's all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next time with another great Tech Guy podcast. Thanks for joining me. See you next time.